Okay, we are live. Right. Wonderful. They sir, you can start. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Webinar. Uh, we are having actually lots of. You can't hear anything. There are some technical problem, so we can't hear sir clearly. So as our secretary, uh, Dr. Partha Sarkar is also joining. So we'll wait for a minute to hear from him. Then we'll start our webinar. Rajivda, is that fine? Yeah, Dr. Partha Sarkar, we'll request you to say a few words. Then we'll start the scientific discussion. Hi, Dr. Partha. Hi. How are you? What's the situation over there? Hi, uh... Still okay, not too bad, but we are we are in the lockdown for seven days. Oh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. We have also the second round of lockdown here also, and we are facing a lot of problems because the cases are increasing day by day. So the condition of this West Bengal actually is uh, nearby Kolkata actually. The Kolkata and the surrounding district there is a North Chubbis Paragona. It is the actually the hotspot, totally hotspot, and. There is a second round of lockdown, but this is not much effective because it is, uh, the containment zones are locked down. So this is not much effective, I think so. But the, uh, all the market of that containment zone is closed. So this is the only advantage that there is not much crowd over in the road. Right, right. Okay. Hi, Dr. Roger. Our secretary is also there. Yeah. Hi, Joy. Yeah, hi. So, Good afternoon. Dr. Sarkar to say the welcome address from WA, then we can hear something from uh, our respected faculty, then we can start the scientific discussion. To Dr. Sarkar, please. Okay, welcome to this uh, foot and ankle web webinar, and we are very much pleased to have with us Indian Foot and Ankle Society, and I must thank uh, our, our IFAS president, Dr. Rajiv Bora, and Dr. Ajoy, the secretary, and especially Dr. Kumar Santunu Anand. And also, I must thank our uh, expert panel, that is our Protus Chatterjee, sir, our past president, West Bengal Orthopedic Association, Dr. Shonanu Savanto, Dr. Kusal Nag, dedicated foot and ankle surgeon, and Dr. Abhijit Bandavada, and also Dr. Rakesh Daripa, it is a young surgeon, he is emerging foot and ankle surgeon, he has his dedicated uh, training over in foot and ankle in Singapore. And so uh, we have also our expert web coordinator, uh, Dr. Arnob Kormokar. He is very much efficient and he is doing this whole job silently. And also our scientific team, that is Dr. Rajiv uh, Raman is the chairman and Dr. Sobhosit Satta is the scientific convener. And, and with all the, uh, and all uh, above all, our president, Professor Chinmay Desai, is very much cooperating in all the, this webinar and we are very much thankful to him that he is he, he, because of his continuous support and today this uh, foot and ankle webinar is the well chosen topic i think it will be enjoyed by all our members so i will not take much time i must hand over this to our uh, web, uh, or, or no or no please yes. continue thank you thank you dr sarkar so uh, we, we welcome uh, all the faculties from Indian Foot Ankle Society uh, from the West Bengal Orthopedic Association. So I'll request uh, respected uh, Dr. Rajiv Bora, sir, who is the president of Indian Foot and Ankle Society to say a few words and then start the scientific discussion because we are going to start from this presentation only. So over to you, sir. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to, with you, with you, to be with you uh, uh, West Bengal Orthopedic Association. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Raman contacted me for this webinar and uh, 
then I asked him what is the topic he wants. So he said the foot and ankle trauma is one thing which everyone is doing. So they must be interested uh, in foot and ankle trauma. So we decided to be this webinar on foot and ankle trauma. And instead of doing some lectures, we have planned that we will discuss the cases which is uh, a better way of uh, learning uh, and uh, teaching both. So we can learn through each other's cases that, uh, and how the different parts of India are handling the similar type of cases, their views, their way of thinking and how they approach the fractures. So uh, if I have the permission, I can start with my uh, few cases. I have been asked to uh, present uh, cases on ankle and uh, some cases on left frank. So I have picked up uh, these few cases. So I can start whenever you want me to stop. I can stop. I have cases whichever you want to uh, feel like. So you can just let me uh, let me know. So should I move on? Yes, sir. Please. Please sure, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll share my screen. Let me see. I'm trying to. Okay. Mm, I can take this one. Yeah. So, is it visible? My screen is visible to everyone? Yes. And sir. Yes, it audible is. Audible to everyone? Yes. Yes, you are. Yes, yes, so, yes. Uh, this is so the please make it in yeah. presentation mode. Okay, I, I will slide, slide show from this. Okay, that's fine. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so this is the first case. I have a, a 37 year old male a road traffic accident and uh, has got an injury to the left ankle, no associated injuries, no medical comorbidities. And uh, we presume that the skin is good, the soft tissues are good. So uh, now uh, the, it's open to panel uh, what they would like to do next in this case. Or anyone who would like to uh, say something, comment about the x-rays, uh, which can actually, we can have an idea what. Shantanuda? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll start. Thank you so much. I think, sir, from the X-ray AP in lateral view, it's a trimalular fracture because in the AP view, I can see a fracture of the medial malleolus as well as the lateral malleolus. In the lateral view, I can see there is a fracture of the posterior malleolus. So that's a very serious fracture for me, something to be taken very seriously. The fracture of the lateral malleolus is transcendismotic. So I'll also be uh, concerned during my surgery or in planning to see whether syndosmotic injury is there or whether when I perform the surgery, it is really taken care of. So from here, I'll probably go for a CT scan. Okay. Uh, sir, I, I asked for a knee x-ray in this case. Unfortunately, I don't have it. But the uh, thing surely... is that there should be a knee x-ray because uh, I... there may be some syndesmotic injury, which maybe some relevant with that proximal knee injury, maybe some people are fractured. Maybe. I, I, uh, unlikely because I think this is more like a supination injury, so unlikely that the uh, proximal there would be an injury yeah. more proximal to that. Uh, I, I have yet to see a proximal, uh, probably Abhijit wanted to say it's a mason of sort of injury, but yeah. uh, in, in this type of fracture, I, I have not seen uh, any. A proximal fracture like that. I don't okay. know if anyone in in uh, the panel has seen with this type of a fracture a proximal. But I agree with him that we should have a proximal X-ray. But uh, my experience is that in such fractures, I, I have not seen. Uh, a if anyone has seen it, I'll be more than happy to know about it. And if Abhijit has had any chance of seeing proximal, uh, it will be addition to our. Uh, you know, uh, knowledge. Yeah, as told by Ajay, sir, it's less common supination type of yeah. injury. So, yes. yeah. quite rare. Okay. The so only thing I think next... we can have a CT scan. 
Okay. Yes. Here you get it. The posterior. La. Now, now this is the CD scan we have. Uh, uh, we can see uh, if, if we really see uh, all this, uh, everything. This is this is the CT now we have uh, uh, with me. So um, I can do another one. This is how you see uh, from the uh, from the anterior side, from the posterior side, from the lateral side, and from the medial side. So this is a 3D reconstruction. And uh, now uh, I would like to ask uh, and plan what is the approach, how you guys uh, uh, put your patients uh, for that approach, how sequence or the implants. Anyone in the panel so, who would... Should I start? Yeah, anyone can, uh, you know, uh, come up so that I... Then I'll show what I have done. Uh, what... What right. approach normally this uh, this fracture should need for? So first. I can see that the the posterior malleolus is more on the median side. So I'll take a lateral approach as well as a posterior median approach. Okay. So any all of us agree to this? Or? Yeah, I, I think so. A supine position should be sufficient for this. In the supine position, we can fix the lateral malleolus also, and uh, this would be a posterior medial approach. So posterior medial, we can get both these fragments in. There's a medial as well as the posterior okay. of the medial so i think uh, that should uh, work out as, well as per the uh, as far as position is concerned i i do agree with the my friend ajoy that this can be done in supine but i have come around to operating such cases which involve a good chunk of posterior malleolus in prone position and uh, <laughs> with practice i have seen that we can fix the medial malleolus in prone position as well so probably, although many people can do very well with the supine position, I personally would prefer a post uh, a prone position. So, For so me, I, it's a floppy yeah. lateral, I think, it's, uh, because you can just prone it and make it, uh, you can approach medially also. So yes, floppy lateral, normally you can fine. put a plate on the posterior lateral aspect. And, and that so, is also help to fix the medial malleolus. Yeah. Floppy lateral. So that is what my preference is. I normally use a floppy lateral position for these uh, patients where I can do both the posterior middle and, and uh, the lateral approach and it becomes very easy for me. And uh, as far as the sequence is concerned, most of the time I would like to fix the posterior malleolus first in cases, uh, in cases like this and then uh, uh, fix the fibula and go on to the medial malleolus and the implants are dependent upon the size uh, of the fragment and uh, uh, that is uh, what I do. Now I can show. So uh, we had a discussion about the plan approach and then I can show what we have done. So this is what everyone was suggesting. You go to the postural medial approach. So this is the incision which I gave from here. You can go right up to the uh, posterior malleolus as well as you can go up to the medial malleolus. So it becomes very easy from uh, that you, you can make the intervals uh, anywhere you want. This is what we have taken, both the tip post as well as the FDL anteriorly and approach the malleolus. So what we did, uh, this was what we did. If you see, we first fixed the posterior malleolus, then we inserted the plate. And then I have used the two screws because I found that the there was a reasonably big chunk. So, chunk was it. Uh, and so I, I could just fix it with this. And then again, if you see here, these are the screws where we, we went and through the same incision, a plate, because this was a vertical shear fracture, you see how I have proceeded. First, I, it is just a buttressing sort of plate where, where I, have, I have not put anything into the medial malleolus. And then uh, keeping in view the shear sort of fracture, I, I, I went and uh, this is how uh, this was approached. Uh, the incision I, I, I showed uh, you people. Uh, this is how the floppy lateral position I had, uh, the bump. Now, this is uh, the uh, incision which has been used. The, the tendons are of the FDL and uh, tibialis procedure are retracted. And this is the medial uh, posterior malleolus, which I'm seeing. This is you know, the first, we, we just fix it with the uh, uh, and it is through the same uh, incision, you can even go up to the medial malleolus. 
so uh, you can fix it and this is how it look immediately uh, post op uh, and then this is how it is healed so any comments anything before i go to the next uh, case posterior malleolus when do you prefer buttress plate dr ajay uh, if there is too much of comminution which is there then i would prefer a buttress plate in this in those instances something like this where it's a big chunk i think screw fixation itself would be quite convenient and it is sufficient so any any other question if if there is uh, regarding this so i i can move on to another ankle case uh, if anyone wants to add anything no okay no dr okay. ajay any comment yeah. on the previous case no nothing at all so it's just that it's been perfectly done so the all the, the it's actually a supination with an uh, it's an inversion kind of an injury it's more of an adduction injury it's not actual inversion it's an adduction injury that's the reason it has got that unusual posterior medial spike because if it were to be a supination external rotation we'd have had a lateral side so we'd have had a posterior lateral avulsion whereas in this case it was a medial avulsion and a medial fracture itself so it's more like a supination adduction injury so i think that's the way to do it is to one is to buttress on the medial side which has been perfectly done and the posterior medial the fragment which was there has to be fixed with a couple of screws which has been done and a lateral fixation so i think uh, held out to length perfectly aligned i think that's the best anybody could do uh, uh, now I, we more i uh -huh. i can ask uh, rajiv pura sir if yeah, at yeah. all you have to fix plate in posterior malleolus yeah what is your preferable plate plate i mean uh, which configuration i i am coming to uh, cases where i have plates okay. <laughs> both plates right, yeah. okay. Okay. i i i have cases where okay. we have okay. plate okay. and everything okay, okay. so okay. that is 47 female fall from stairs injury left ankle no associated injury and soft tissues we waited and everything is okay now now this is the situation uh, uh, and anyone yes again this is a severe injury in the sense that there is not only a fracture but there is also a dislocation mm -hmm. so as soon as the patient come i like to splint this case and if required i may even be tempted to put an external fixator just to reduce the fragment closely so once that is done we cannot leave it as such because if the patient comes let's say on the first day or second day that soft tissue condition will not be conducive to surgery so we'll not do the definitive surgery immediately we'll wait for soft tissue to cool down but in the meantime i like to reduce this as possible and then put a, a splint or if required then i'll put an expex in this case and then we can scan it ct scan done and then i'll move ahead with my planning okay so um... i would do i don't know whether it's fortunately or unfortunately but reducing <laughs> but what we do is uh, in most of the cases we don't want the soft tissue swellings to develop and blisters to develop so we go ahead with the most of the time as early as fixation is possible but if the soft, soft tissues tissue, if the soft if the soft tissues don't permit then it is mandatory as dr shantanu said to try to reduce it and stabilize it in a reduced position for which you may need a fixator so this is very important i certainly agree with him so it depends on your situation when you are ready for surgery what is the skin condition but one thing i would just want to convey that if we have to wait for longer time we should never reduce uh, we should never keep the ankle unreduced we should try to stabilize it in a reduced position a position yes. now you know whether it is stable in a splint or whether it is stable in x fix whatever it is it has to be splinted okay yes. now i i i i have brought uh, the you see the, this is you are seeing the calcaneus so and this is the lateral side if you are seeing here the calonavicular this is the medial side no, and, no. This is, and this is how it is looking like now uh, uh, the Uh, i think uh, all of us have the fair assessment of uh, this case can we ask now the panel uh, what now they would like to do this case yes sir yeah. uh, yeah. okay you can see that the posterior malleolus is rather comminuted 
Yeah. And I may imagine that you might have to use two plates rather than one. Mm -hmm. It will require a plate. Mm -hmm. So that uh, so uh, that this is the case. Probably will require a plate. Okay. Yes, I think so. Because in this case, we can go in for a posterior lateral approach because this is more of a lateral kind of an injury. This is supination external rotation four. So mm -hmm. the other one, the previous one was an adduction. This is an external rotation. So we have mm -hmm. a fracture which is running this way. I think uh, a plating would definitely be required in this case for the posterior malleolus, and uh, 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 posterior lateral approach would be perfect. So in this case, we can either go in a prone position and fix the medial, or we can go uh, as flop lateral as uh, uh, Rajiv sir does. So first fix, I would prefer at least to first reduce the lateral malleolus, bring it out to length. And uh, then on going for the uh, posterior lateral fragment. I want a debate here now. Yes, so you want only one approach to this fracture, that is the posterior lateral. Yes, that should be fine. And uh, from the medial side, we definitely need to fix it separately. Yeah. Uh, so that that is. So you are looking something for the medial approach and the posterior lateral approach. Posterior lateral approach. Yes. Anyone differs in this? Uh, no. Single approach is only. Uh, I don't prefer, uh, Doctor Ajay, because you stretch lots of lots of soft tissue. Already, the soft tissue injured and humes get mm -hmm. damaged. So I, I single approach sing produces, no, no. Uh, I think, excessive stress over the soft tissue. No, single is not possible. Through the posterior lateral, we can fix the fibula and, and the posterior. Oh, oh, all right, all right. You said good. medial and the posterior lateral approach. Oh, yeah. All right, all right. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, Kushal. Kushal has joined. Kushal, your comment on this? I just joined Rajinda, so I'm, I haven't seen the X-rays. Hi, uh, Kushal. Can you see it now? Yeah, we can show you X-ray. Can you see it now? Yeah, I can, can see it. Yeah. yeah, I can see it. Okay. Uh, do you want me to show the X-rays? Okay. This is all the slide which I have run. This is the first one, and this is the second one, and we were discussing uh, yeah. the approach and. Uh, uh, so, so I think the question was whether you want to fix the... Yeah, field. and now this I put a 3D recon also from the lateral side, from the medial side, yes. what do you see, and uh, from the anterior and the posterior, all, 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 all these are there. I think, sir, I think this was one of the cases we discussed last time, no? where you said you, you had put two plates. Yeah, custom. yeah, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, don't, you don't need to disclose, Pushal, right now, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we, are, we are just doing okay, it. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> This is quite a bad uh, fact. Uh, yeah. SCR4 with the, the entire posterior rim being a ball stop. Uh, so it's quite a sort of a bad injury. Okay. Uh, I, 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 this is what I was again uh, the same thing uh, uh, keeping in mind. So I actually uh, used a postural lateral approach uh, for, uh, for this uh, fibula and for the this part component of the. And then I went something in between the dead medial and the posterior medial. Mm -hmm. So in between that, I would say. From that, you can go, you can make different windows to, uh, uh, to this side. So, uh, so this was what uh, I used, and this is what I could get in those cases. Now, uh, uh, we have used two plates in, in, in this case. And uh, uh, you see, this is uh, uh, what we did. So uh, here we have used plates. Abhijit was asking that what type of plates. So I can show here I have used two plates. Uh, uh, yeah, you the... use recon plates. Uh, just a simple recon plates recon. and uh, uh, everything has been done. And this is uh, just one and a half month follow up of that patient. And uh, if you see these, the, these scars are still there of the postural lateral approach. So it does not, dis uh, so I, we followed this patient around about one to one and a half month and yet yet only and we've just started the range of movement exercises so i did recently this case so i thought maybe i i, I can uh, uh, share with you guys that uh, any comment yes because you've done it so beautifully so i don't know whether we should be spending so much for the special plates which do come in because you've no. got a perfect reduction <laughs> and, uh... no i'm very fond of this uh, recon plate right. yes and yeah, I so use it everywhere, everywhere uh, if you see most of the ankle fractures, this or a lower end radius. I have another case where I've used the lower end radius. I think if I get a time, I think I, I if you want, I can do it later on. But let me go to a list prank case. Uh, uh, one more thing to add, if, if you notice what uh, Dr. Vora has done, you don't need to put screws in the terminal screws. 
in the terminal holes. So what I usually do, I would usually buttress it and leave the terminal uh, holes open. It will just fall into it and compress the fragments. So it saves yeah. you, prevents you from commuting the smaller fragments further with yeah. these uh, conventional plates. Exactly. Yes, 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 Kushal, you are absolutely right. Because any sort of buttressing really doesn't need a terminal screw all the time. It may be required in few cases, but most of the time you can leave the hole as such. Correct, correct. Uh, I, 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 I use a buttressing principle to reduce the fracture. Once they are well reduced, and if the chunk is good, I don't mind putting screws. Thank if you. the chunk is very small, where if you put the screws, you are further growing to crack the fracture, absolutely. then I, then I don't use this. Yes, this, is, this is how I, I do it. So, okay. And uh, I think, what about a one third tubular plates? Have you ever used those or you find them I, to be I, too I, flimsy? I am, I'm, I'm little scary of one third. Uh, to me, uh, these it's plates flimsy. are very flimsy. Uh, the type of the plates which are available in the Indian market, they, they are uh, very, very uh, uh, difficult. Okay, we can take one different type of fracture in ankle and then I'll go to the list rank. This is a quick fracture uh, uh, which I have. Not, not much to... Uh, This was how you know uh, it was referred to us. Uh, in four weeks, someone had done it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I had so, similar one. Uh, you have a similar one, so I'll yeah. quickly go through what, uh, no, what no, I have. No, I'm not presenting that one here. I'm just saying that I had a similar one uh, oh, okay. about uh, two months back. Similar case. Okay, okay, okay. I mean, it, it was operated. Yes, yes. The patient came with operation with two screws on middle malleoli, middle malleolus, and there was a wound actually, and the ankle was never reduced. That's the way it is there in this case. Okay. So, so basically a supination reduction injury, you see a vertical fracture, there is an impaction of the uh, articular surface, and, and it should have been reduced, and uh, the best thing to be used was a plate here. So what, what we did was uh, I know, uh, uh, I agree with the one thing, we have not been able to get the fibular uh, length right, uh, but still the function was good. We, we, we used uh, artificial graft for this and a sturdy plate, you know, the distal fibula. And uh, we have been following this patient. This is how uh, at one year follow up. Now we have at least, uh, and this is the range of movements we could get. Uh, so I agree that in this case, uh, uh, the length of the fibula was slightly short. It should have been more. Uh, apart from that, uh, any comments? Any anyone else would like to do a little differently this case? So, so what was the uh, what was the difficulty, sir? I mean, uh, intra-op, we couldn't get the length. What was the problem? I mean, what was the what issue? Was, it's uh, comminuted, I think. Badly comminuted. Plus, badly I think comminuted here. If, if you if you go here. Uh, if you go back, you look, and there was already a uh, lot. And yes. here, to get the length is little. Either you have to then do an osteotomy yeah. to get here. We yeah. could have added one extra osteotomy, but to get a length here is going to be a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because by four weeks, the, right. these ends get absorbed. Right. 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 Uh, and then if you want to compress them or bring them together, it is quite obvious you will get some so, shortening here. So. I, I agree that uh, I would have added, but sometimes we have seen people who have uh, now even the dime sign in the latest literature is getting challenged. Some people have a yes. short fibuli, and when they have compared to the other side, they have found that even their fibuli was also very short. <laughs> so this is another concept which is coming up uh, latest, but fortunately, I could get good results, and what I did uh, didn't do right. I have pointed it out that I should have. If I do this fracture uh, now, I would like to take an X-ray of the other side and see how short is the uh, fibula, uh, and uh, then I, I would try to uh, replace it. So uh, you can do an early revisions. That is uh, in, that if you have a 
mal reduced ankle and uh, this is what the literature says and this is what we did i have a few cases of ankle but i would now go to the list prank two cases and then if you want uh, me to uh, okay rajiv just just a small question from my yeah. side when you yes, when sir. you get when you get these sort of delayed cases like your distal fibula is fractured and four weeks time yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you do like for the fibula length to achieve like you know, fix the distal part then you go with the osteotomy and distract that fragment and try to achieve that whether it is possible in this case or it is like you yeah, saw it, like is it is possible then you have to really clear everything syndesmosis and all that only then you can get it it's a just yeah, a four it's a just a four week so we thought whatever we could get if we were but uh, i i have a few neglected cases where i've done fibular osteotomies if, if the time permits i can show the the malreduce and neglected cases uh, afterwards yeah. if, if you want it i can show them okay now this is the situation this this was a 56 year male and he had an ankle fracture and the less frank injury on the same side so we first fix the ankle this is how and uh, this is if you see uh, the list frank injury and uh, we don't have a good view but i have an intra of view suggesting this is the injury now now, now uh, 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 you can see whatever has happened in in, in this intra of view so anything how to proceed in what the persons will like to do first which bone they would like to use what approach they would like to use so the dual approach here yeah. okay dual approach what, what is the approach uh, the dual where 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 are incisions yes, are first, in the dual approach. first first incision between the first web space and the second incision between the third and the fourth one sure. second and uh, third and the fourth yes okay so, so yeah, anyone yeah. uh-huh some kind of maneuver maneuvering may be required to bring it back to the position and once in, it is in position then we can fix it do you so, have any other views or any other views any uh, ap view uh, okay, i think even the navicular is fractured in this yeah, yeah. yeah so i think you should, uh, so we should this is uh, what i have at the moment if you see this is everything is sublux it's yeah, quite it's a long uh, so long, uh, so everything is sublux long dorsal incision based on the first web space so basically i like to sort out my medial column first uh, mm -hmm. before i go and do additional incision so yes we'll start with one incision and fix the navicular with maybe a herbert screw or something and then put the quiniforms back reconstruct the medial intermediate column and then if, if necessary then open up the uh, incision laterally anterior laterally okay yes, kunal completely agree but this is a real huge injury and this will very need double incision medial one is the bigger one you have to categorically fix the medial 3 and all the cuneiforms and the navicular from the medial incision and laterally you just fix with the k wires as we do yeah for fixing so, k wires you don't need to open so if it falls back in place then you can uh, jolly well put k wires and uh, wait and watch if it doesn't then you open up of course yeah yeah that's because, why i start with one incision and decide on another yeah, so, yeah. so what i gather is uh, anyone for k wire fixations in this no 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 way k wire no big no for k wire oh, okay so and it is just a temporary tape. step temporary you want to use the k wires to stabilize everything am i right yes yes temporary yeah, reduction you can if, use if, if, if the soft tissue doesn't permit then you can go with the k wires and whatever but no i'm we are presuming in this case the soft tissues are yes, soft tissue soft tissue is usually hugely hugely uh, burnt out yeah they are but in this case normally we have waited and everything is okay so okay. so, uh, so i'm just putting it that way because i have brought more cases to show the uh, fixation and approaches than discuss the soft tissues which okay. we can do an open uh, any on open fractures or something i have lot of cases on that if you want a uh, soft tissue conditions but uh, this is my basic idea is to uh, discuss the surgical planning so that is why i have brought these two planning is rajiv oh. like as you are asking like medial 3 rigidly fix it and fourth and fifth just make, keep it mobile okay uh, so uh, anyone would like to do an orthodesis primary in this case no i think it's salvageable yeah salvageable okay 
Or so, or so what we did was this is what we we did. So we always believe that the proximal thing has to be done first. That is what I wanted. So you reduce the navicular, you do reduce the intercuniform, and then pin in this, uh, you know, uh, uh, this second metatarsal in, in, into position. Then you have a solid base, you know, uh, on which you can build the remaining list frank. You have a solid base at the intercuniform and this level. So we kept on. Once this is done, then, then we had a solid base on which we were going to reconstruct. Then we pinned in the second, uh, 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 you know, the metatarsal to the cuneiform to create the uh, Lisfranc. And then this is how I use the Lisfranc screw in these cases. Now, yes. you see, uh, here nothing has been done to this. Why? Because there was no injury. The forces actually, which came from here, went here then and uh, fractured. So there was, this is a little atypical to get nothing here. So we didn't do anything on this side. So we never needed anything on this side. Then we spanned this. We spanned this also because we were, you know, uh, uh, we were uh, worried that there is some instability here and uh, this fracture will automatically come in position. After doing this, then... Uh, this is what we did. We stabilized the, you know, the uh, two uh, lateral columns, which brought uh, this third column into position. And then this was badly combinated, and we just did an aphrodisis uh, of this. So we we did everything here, but this one was authored arthrodis because it was uh, uh, badly combinated, and this is how it, it, it looked later on and this is how the incisions what you were saying uh, look later on so maybe uh, anything uh, else uh, would you like to put drain in such type of cases extension yes I, I always put this is maybe four or five days later on i always put uh, 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 drains in in in, in these uh, uh, cases okay then i can go for one last whispering case and then if you have any time, then I can, uh, uh, you can ask me later on, I can add a few cases uh, if you want. So maybe slide show from me. 19 year old male treated by massage and uh, now has the pain in the midfoot region walking and he reported six months after the injury. So. <laughs> So I don't think so. All of us agree that we'll do an arthrodesis in this case, or yes, yes. yes. <laughs> non salvageable. So, so that is more or less non salvageable, Rajiv. Yeah. So yeah. I think I think we all agree with the arthrodesis. Okay. So, and even uh, the arthrodesis, the pain is very minimal. After the, if you can do it, we can do yeah. it perfectly. So I will agree with the arthrodesis. Okay. So the approach is once again now. Now if we come here and uh, if we see that uh, how if you uh, I, I would just like to ask people uh, if they think they have a they have to restrict themselves to the first second and the third and if only first and second uh, how what approach they prefer let's say we have to just uh, uh, go for the first ray and the second ray uh, then then the the incision we uh, talk that is between the first ray and the second ray we go Imagine if we, we have to go to the third also along with it. Would they like to uh, go through one incision or two incisions? No, no, always two. No, no, always. One, one, always two. Always two. Always two. So you have to go one and three or two and three? One, two and then three. three. Oh, then, two. then a long incision over the second metatarsal can do the job because then you yeah. can go this that way. Meet you can make the two windows. Yeah, that is what I'm saying. So that this is the this, uh, you know a little debate. Some people want to use, uh, so I wanted to bring it out. But both are okay. You have to see that when you are using a long incision, but you should not do much of stretching. If you yes, have right. any soft tissue problems in such cases which are there, instead of 
uh, doing one long incision and stretching lots of soft tissues, I think uh, it is better to make two incisions. So you know how many windows you uh, you require in these cases. So uh, so we used a, a two incision approach in this case. This is how we we went. Then we we use these type of distractors to actually to prepare the joint. And then this is how we open the intercuniform. You see, this is the intercuniform opening we have done. Then then this is uh, uh, we we use the K wires to drill uh, everything. And then another incision was used, which was for the third ray. And this was opened again with the help of the Hinterman to pair. And this is how we went on. Uh, to do the first second and uh, put a, a lot of uh, graft into it and this is a short video this is how uh, I, I, I use a, a little long incision instead of what you said in between the two rays and I don't want to uh, stretch my soft tissues much and uh, just giving the skin incision so that we don't disrupt the uh, uh, superficial uh, uh, nerves in these cases, then I, I try to uh, trace the EHL, uh, which, which is, uh, uh, you can see here now it is visible, the EHL is visible, and then this is the EHB, which is available, and then you try to trace the vessels, you know, in between the EHL and the EHB, so now you know where actually your your vessels are. Uh, they are right in front of you. Uh, you can see uh, the whole neurovascular bundle. Then just under the EHL, you give you go right to the uh, uh, joint, and now you see you can uh, keep on uh, moving both medially as well as the lateral to the joint. And this is how once you are done with this, then you can move towards the intercuniform uh, area you can see and here you can go into the intercuniform uh, part also and then you bring your dissection down to expose the uh, second uh, uh, metatarsal and then this is you have now right in front of you the medial cuneiform the the uh, the uh, middle cuneiform the first metatarsal and the and the second metatarsal so now you can just start uh, uh, preparing your joints as I showed you. Uh, this is again, I'm reaching the, this is the second uh, uh, TMT joint. This is the intercuniform, which is prepared. So I just wanted to show how all the joints have to be, you know, prepared for arthrodesis. It is just not like this and how, and this is, you need a osteotomes and uh, curates to uh, good curates uh, to prepare your joints and once you are happy with your preparation then then you can remove the uh, and then you can sequentially go from one joint to an other joint and uh, uh, prepare all the joints uh, intercuniform this is now we have put into the uh, second tmt joint and we are preparing first we use the first tmt second TMT, then we prepared the intercuniform and you see how individually every joint has been distracted so that you can go into the depths of the joint. It is very important that you can actually go into the depths of the joint to fully prepare the joint. It is it, the joint preparation and the joint exposure is this is the another incision which we I used uh, for the for the third TMT uh, in this case and again this is the EDP you are seeing. Again, distractor has been used to expose the joint, to prepare the joint thoroughly. Once they are prepared and uh, you, you drill these, uh, uh, the opposing surfaces with the, with the bit or, uh, with the, or with the K wire, whatever you want, depending, and then you can add a, a, a graft into this uh, to uh, get uh, uh, the full av everything uh, in so that everything is in uh, position. So basically I wanted to show uh, how, how the steps which you normally uh, I, I take in arthrodesis and uh, this is how, how you can keep on proceeding. I've already shown you uh, the, uh, the, the way we fix this. 
uh, I have already shown you uh, uh, that. So this is a few cases which I have done here. You see simple, uh, this was some early case where we just used, uh, uh, we never had good plates. So we again, a recon plate was used. This is some other case. And here then we kept on changing our plates. Now we have a better plates which are available and you can use. And this is the incision I use in these cases. So I think uh, they were fair enough. I have uh, covered. Uh, uh, so I think, uh, is it good enough or you still want more cases? No, no, no. Uh, yeah. These are very good cases because list francs are always a problematic things and decision making how to go ahead. Rajiv, nowadays, now, now many people are uh, telling like you can go with the only screws. Do you, what, what's your opinion on that? Uh, so only screws you uh, mean is in a, in a arthrodesis or yes. in, in a fresh or, or case? Fresh case. Fresh case. Do you? Do, uh, I, do uh, I, I have moved away from the screws. Uh, if we can okay. get any apposition, why to destroy the articular surfaces? Whatever the, uh, you know, movement is, it's a rigid joint. We say less of movement. But even if a few millimeter of movement is there, why we want? So I have moved completely away from the screws in uh, in this. Then to coming, to, coming to arthrodesis, if you That's think you can add uh, interfragmentary sort of compression screws and there are good surfaces and bones, you can do it. But if you cannot have those compression screws, it is better you have this a list frank screws and you can even go from first metatarsal to the second meta, uh, metatarsal. So in those cases, uh, uh, you can uh, 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 so you can put the screws from intermetatarsal screws. Then you in those cases. So wherever is possible, basically you have to have prepare your surfaces well, get them well opposed, and then stabilize it. It is you who have to decide whether you can stabilize with the screws or plates or whatever it is. So it is entirely on you. The principle remains, you have to follow the principles. But in acute cases where I want to preserve the joint, definitely now I don't have any role of the screws in those cases. I don't want to disturb the articular cartilage in those. You rely on the KVRs only, no? No, uh, plates. Please. Please. Extra articular fixation. Extra articular fixation. Extra articular fixation. That's what I that's what I showed in in that case. I used only plates and I I used only one Liz Frank screw. That is the punch bobby type of screw. Yes, punch bobby right. type of. Fixer. If you want, I can go back to that case. If you if if you want, I, uh, do you need to remove this plate, Rajiv Bora sir? Whether you uh, yes. after the. Uh, yes, uh, most of the time I, I would like to wait at least for one year and ask the people to walk on it. If they feel they are irritating, only then I remove. Otherwise, I don't remove it if they have any complaint. Let them walk on that. Doesn't matter. So. Okay. Thank you, Raji, for your excellent cases, obviously. No, no I think Kushal will present his case. Kushal? Yeah, I'll, do, I'll, do. I'll present a Taylor's fracture. Okay. Please share your screen, Kushal. I'll share my screen. Hi, Ajay. Seeing up yeah, a long time. Yes, yes, yes. And I see so with such a change in you. Yeah, yeah, change. It is this <laughs> unlock look. <laughs> <laughs> trying to follow, trying to follow you. Oh, Wal walrus mustaches. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. One second, huh? Yeah. Yes. Uh, share this now. I had a case which had a postural lateral approach, but I thought it will be again too much. Uh, the other people have to, you know, also contribute. <laughs> So all the cases were quite excellent. Yeah. Social, please. Unusual fracture. In a way, this, this gentleman is a labor in a, the contractor rather, in a construction firm. He came to me one day with a, with, with a history of fall of a granite slab on his 
on both of his feet, right? It, the granite slab fell on his feet, and uh, it was already uh, two weeks after the injury. It was referred to by uh, to me by one of my senior colleagues. So he had a. Uh, this was the X-ray he came to me with, and uh, the AP X-ray looks uh, very benign. Uh, lateral X-ray is suspicious of a fracture there. So uh, this is this is this is all the extra that he had. So uh, and and after the X-rays, uh, obviously I uh, went for a CT scan. And uh, this so is the CT. dislocation also in addition. Yeah. So what was funny was that this was a uh, this was a Taylor head fracture, an oblique yeah. fracture of the Taylor head. And uh, I've never seen anything like this before. Uh, of course, I tried to figure out whether they, how can I classify this, and and there's no way I could uh, put this in any bracket, you know, or any 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 family going by the classical uh, classification system, the Hawkins system that we have. It was a direct uh, injury to the Taylor's. It was already uh, two weeks. He came to me before that. By the time he came to me, and uh, obviously uh, I told him that he would need a surgery, and I was I was not sure as to whether. Uh, what are the odds of avian so what what are the odds that i and i would give him so any thoughts from the panel have they seen any fractures like this what would what would be the odds of a avian in this in these sort of cases uh, i guess this is really a very uh, unusual case as you have rightly pointed out and uh, the odds of avian are rather high i would say because the only blood supply to the head comes from this direction and that is gone. So I would assume that the chance of AVN is rather high in this case. I really don't know. That is my assumption. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Ajit sir, um, uh, uh, Chandu sir, any one of you have, you have you have a longer career than we have, so you must have seen. Yeah, no, these are very uncommon cases, uncommon. Uh, number one. Uh, the the blood supply to, to this area is basic from the medial tarsal artery of the dorsalis pedis, which is basically giving uh, the blood supply to uh, this area. Mm -hmm. These these are sheared or sort of fractures, but the, it is little. Uh, uh, the mode of injury I I, I cannot uh, correlate with the type of the fractures. These yes. fractures are actually loaded uh, are reported with an axial sort of loads with yeah. the inversion. And then uh, uh, the, the, you get an oblique fracture of the head of the talus. And then these, these, uh, the, the, these part of the, 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 uh, the talus sometimes get perched into uh, uh, the navicular, lateral end of the navicular, and they can get the locked sort of uh, a dislocation. This has been a well-described pattern, in, uh, uh, and this is the mode of the injury which has been described. Keeping in view the now the, the remaining vascularity is intact. So once there is an intra osseous uh, connections in the talus also. So if you reduce them in place, then you may get away with the. Uh, but there are definitely very high chances of uh, AVN after uh, the talus head and the because that is the only supply in this area mm. and very little intra. Uh, so you you can have a very high incidence of uh, uh, AVN in this. Uh, the, after a teller body fractures, this is another area where you can have a, a, a very high AVN. So, so my, my question is, do we need to revisit the classification system that we have? Is it insufficient to explain these fractures? No, no I think teller head is fractures well is a separate one. Yeah. It, it's it is well explained. Teller head, this type of injury is well explained in literature. The head, head of the talus fractures, there are the two types are there, the shear and the, the, yeah. the compression. So, so, so this so, so, forms one of those, yes. Uh, it has been explained. So it is not like that, it has not been. Okay, so this was uh, what happened. So after two weeks, anyway, the swelling had come down. Yeah. So I did a uh, dorsal approach. And dorsal this, is approach. this is the Taylor head. Yeah. This is the Taylor body. So mm -hmm. uh, this was the, the fracture was like this. After This is before reduction. Mm -hmm. And this is after reduction. You can see a lot of uh, combination in the medial border of the neck. Mm -hmm. So a uh, lot of combination, a lot of bone loss after almost two weeks. And he was uh, limping around. I mean, he was not walking properly, but he was limping around uh, uh, without any sort of uh, 
immobilization. So I guess that's the reason why it happened. I mean, it contributed a bit more. So this is basically the gap there. So after reduction, this is what I got. And I fixed it with two Hubbard screws. And I could get a decent purchase and uh, and uh, and restore the, the the contour of the talus. So now the so, reduction put reduction looks looks quite good here, and really it's a good nicely. Uh, uh, it's a very I, nicely done case. Did you need a graft in this? Yeah, yeah. I was coming to that, sir. I was yeah, coming, okay. I, I would have loved to give a graft. Wasn't sure what to do, so I did not. Oh. I did not use any bone graft from the calcaneum, nor did I use any uh, synthetic graft. But on hindsight, uh, would, it have, would it have been a good idea? I don't know. I mean, what would you have done? No, with this type of defect, I would have really uh, liked to uh, put a graft into uh, this. Uh, but from the x-rays, it looks that you have been able to get it out of varus also. And yes. in length also. The basic thing is that you shouldn't have any varus inversion yes. and uh, it should be length. Uh, and the, it should, uh, the fixation should be length stable. If you can yes. get it without a graft, it is good. And you think the surfaces are good, it is good. So it is graft or no graft doesn't make difference. The only thing is you should be sure on the table that whether you have got it out of varus and you are in yes. length, then, then it, it is okay and this fixation and sometimes even if you don't get a good fixation even a, a, a i would say a little feeble fixation because of the small head you can add a fixator temporary fixators to them Thank so you. that will uh, unload your fixation for five to six right. weeks and then you can take away the fixator and those fixators they also help you in reduction, reduction as well as the main, uh, maintenance of the reduction afterwards if you have but if you have a good purchase, you don't need a graft. It is very good, yeah. well done case. So no problem. I think it's a very important point that that is making that you should be careful, yes, you should be careful not to uh, make the medial uh, yeah. medial uh, neck collapse. Otherwise, going yeah. to balance. Yeah. That is what, that is what you want to do in these fractures. That's you why know. I think the first screw that we should be giving would be the la anterior lateral with yeah. the posterior medial. So don't yeah. put the medial screw and compress okay. it for otherwise it will collapse. And uh, and here you have used a compression yeah. screw. You could have used a positional screws in, in, in these. Uh, even uh, uh, instead of compressing so, the surface, you can even put a. Uh, so once you compress it, you may get a little shortening. On the medial side. Yeah. The medial side. So, yeah, yeah. So, so Kushal, yeah. I have a question. Hmm. So when you fix this Herbert screw, do you uh, hold this chunk with KOF? Or we yes. just with the with the guide wire of the Herbert the Herbert screws have guide wires, mm -hmm. so I reduce it and then uh, provisionally fix with the guide wires, mm -hmm. check the reduction on the CM and then I then uh, I drill okay. the entry point. I don't drill the entire thing. I drill maybe a half of maybe I'll drill till here or something like that. Just cross mm -hmm. the factor line and then put the compression. Uh, so yeah, provisional fixation and then uh, drilling and then uh, put the screw in. If you mm -hmm. have a synthesis screw, the synthesis screws are anyways self-drilling, mm -hmm. but I don't think this was a local uh, Herbert screw, so I had to drill a bit, uh, at least the mouth of the of the screw. I think Shall, the, uh, when, when we are doing a, any small fragment, whether it's a medial malleolus, whether it is a talus or whatever it is, you should provisionally fix at least two wires Correct. Which and then put the third wire over which you use the cannulated system. The reason is you don't want these small fragments to rotate. Yes. If they are only on one, uh, uh, only on one K wire, you stabilize it and then you try to drill through it and screw it. Invariably, these these small fragments rotate. So rotate. that is, uh, I would suggest uh, to younger generation if you have a smaller fragment. Try to put K wires and then stabilize well. So when you are actually drilling and uh, putting the screws, you, you shouldn't have a shearing forces at the fracture uh, when you are putting the screws. So if you notice this, uh, this was one of the holes of the K of the guide wire, and the other went through the incision. Yeah. So cross wires to uh, hold. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that is very important. And this is exactly what Sir was trying to say. You know, the medial collapse and whether you need 
phone drafts or not. So I think it's a very important point that my the other listeners or our students or DNBs should be keeping in mind. Don't over tight and make the medial uh, column collapse there, the medial wall collapse. One more thing, Kushal, since we are talking about terrace fracture, and as you rightly said, we also need to give uh, some message to our younger people. So when do you use plate? I think it is better if you also explain when do you use a plate for Taylor fixation and which side do you use it? I think we all know it, but it is better that you explain it. Taylor plates are there now, available with synthesis, uh, pre-contoured plates. I would use it for exactly a case like this, which I've been showing, I've shown you. Uh, a pre-contoured plate which comes from the anterior part and goes up to the medial was a very nice plate. Uh, but the problem is I have only used it once because they're frightfully expensive and uh, these patients don't afford. But in an ideal world, uh, a, a, a fracture with a combination like this, you should be plating it so that you can maintain uh, the length of the column and if possible, put bone grafts to augment your fixation. So the, the other indications for the plate, I think we can use a plate whenever there's a medial combination, even in yes. case of a neck or in case of a body also. Yes, yes. So yes, all right. of those also we can use a plate in those cases, uh, not uh, uh, whenever there's a medial combination. Yeah. It's a medial plate which is available. Yeah. I know yeah. the plates are available for the medial side. There's a one latest uh, 2020 review in uh, a AOFS uh, uh, where they have uh, just pointed out that the medial plates can cause quite a lot of uh, uh, problems as far as uh, so when you're using the medial plates you have to be really cautious so there is another paper in JOT in 2016 which showed that you can use a plate on the lateral side as a position okay. on the medial, medial side so you should try to avoid plate on the medial side you can do a good plating on the lateral side and the positional screw on the medial side unless you badly need the plate on the medial side because medial side plates have no to produce impingement antromedial pain and very long pain so yeah. that is my my guide and and it has been proven in uh, uh, in these papers that that the the lateral plates are not that symptomatic while the medial plates are symptomatic so just making a choice of plate, just do give consideration to this fact. That is what I mean. Yeah, so uh, I, I have the, I, I can't find the recent x-ray, but this fellow did well. And to answer Shantanu's question, and he didn't go under, he didn't uh, have any uh, AVN. So this is now one and a half years. Uh, we believe you, sir. <laughs> yeah, so this was October 2018, right? So he's almost uh, coming to two years. He's, he's gone back to his work. And he hasn't come back with any avian <laughs> till date. And I, yes. and I I will dig out the x-ray if I can find my laptop. It shows a Hawking sign, so I was happy no. that uh, he escaped by the skin of his teeth. I don't know how, how far the Hawking okay, sign so will be uh, so, logical so in this. In because this case, yeah. Hawking yeah. sign is basically when your injury is going into the sinus tarsi to the Correct. tarsal canal and then you are uh, taking away the retrograde flow <laughs> from that region. Uh, in, in, into the body. So in those cases, here it will be a diff different size sort of appearance, a sclerotic sort of appearance will be, which will be uh, appearing in the head because you are very unlikely to mm. to to disturb uh, the the up? the artery of the sinus tarsi and the yes. artery of the tarsal canal. Both sides. Both of them. You can. It is very unlikely, unlikely. unless you are very, un, very rude with it. Yes, <laughs> that would disturb that blood supply. Occurs in this case, if avian occurs in this case, there would be flattening of the Taylor head. Taylor head. Yeah. If, yeah, if yeah. there is an avian, which I am very happy, I'm, I'm happy for you, my friend, that it didn't occur in your case. Wait, wait. It's, it's just been two years. Yeah. Let's see. You okay. never know what happens. Yeah. Wait, wait, so five years, I tell you. It has to happen. It should have happened by now. It, it should have happened. happened. Now, now. Oh, yeah. If it is not yeah, happened, it will not happen. Very different. We should very remember, less chances. We should very remember less. that the only thing that ruins your result is a long term follow up. Yes. Right. So I think we'll wait for the jury to be out. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent, excellent case, uh, Kushal. Excellent demonstration. Uh, Shantruda, if you can start. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you so much. Start with your case. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Ah, uh, there I go. Uh, 
Am I audible to everybody? Yes, yes, yes. sure. Oh, thank you so much. And you can see my slides as well. No, no, uh, no, not not no but I have done... our faces. <laughs> Share a screen. Not your slide. Yeah. Uh, I've done that already. I'm surprised. Just a moment. Share the screen. Yes, now it's there. Yeah. Yes. Can you can you see now? Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. Thank you. Just a moment. Yes. So this is a very different kind of a case which uh, uh, my friend Dr. Rajiv Raman requested me to do. It's not a usual trauma case. Alcanias. We can't so, hear you, Santanda. Okay, okay. Yeah, right yeah. now it's okay. Can you yes. hear me now? Yes. Okay, right. So it's a case of uh, chronic osteomyelitis and calcaneus where total calcinectomy was done. Not a very common surgery, but yes, when the indication is there, this comes as a salvage procedure. Yeah. So this was a patient who, who was an active young adult. He was a, a mason by profession. And he presented to me with history of pain, swelling with intermittently discharging wound over a left ankle of, the knee of four years duration. He was also able to bear weight on his uh, side of the limb. There was history of multiple previous procedures. There are probably three or four where some kind of keratage was done, some kind of IND was done, some kind of soft tissue procedure was done. And at the end, when the patient came, he was literally begging for amputation. So let's just review what is chronic osteomyelitis of calcaneus. There are different possible etiologies. The tuberculosis is most common etiology in our country. And this particular patient was he went to Delhi as well. There he was diagnosed as a case of tuberculosis of uh, calcaneus as was given ATT. But the problem was he never took the ATT properly. He probably took it just for six months. And since he was not benefiting, he came back and he didn't continue the treatment. Chronic osteomyelitis of calcaneus, however, can be a sequelae of open fracture. There would be chronic discharging wounds, inability to be weight, as was in our case. There would be, because of disuse, severe wasting of thigh and leg muscles. And these cases of chronic osteomyelitis of calcaneus is often associated with diabetes mellitus as well. So this was the X-ray. So we can see that the whole of the calcaneus is rather sclerotic with sporadic presence of uh, lytic signs. Overall, the calcaneus doesn't look healthy at all. So in such cases where we are suspecting the chronic osteomyelitis of calcaneus, we can go with X-ray, MRI, and also if possible, technetium bone scan. In this case, the patient was in such a uh, bad shape, socioeconomically, he was all broken. So he just could do, afford an X-ray and we had to proceed with this X-ray. So what are the uh, treatment options for a case of chronic osteomyelitis? Of course, we can do local curatage. And the procedure of partial calcinectomy has also been explained in the paper, which is done. And just the affected part is taken out. And in such patient, there would be history of previous multiple procedures, which was there in our case. And many a times, because all other means of eradicating infection fail, we are left with no other choice than to go for below knee amputation, which this patient was asking actually. But then we, I did a review of literature and although at that time the patient had come to me in 2000, uh, 2017 probably, yes, August 2017. So at the time I was just familiar that total calcinectomy is a procedure which can be done. So I just opened up the literature and I chanced upon this very important paper by Judith Bamhar of US, and there it was explained nicely. In fact, there was not much literature available on total calcinectomy because when I run the search on Google, this is what I could lay my hand on. 
So what do we do in total calcinectomy? Whole of the calcaneus is excised out. And this could be, if done properly, can be a very successful alternative to baloney amputation. Because while doing this, we can preserve our functional limb. So these are the pictures. This is how we do. Uh, we call it a split heel approach. And the incision is given on the uh, middle side. We have to maintain the continuity. This is very important. We have to maintain the continuity of tendo Achilles with the plantar tissue. Because basically, bones are pods embedded in soft tissue. The soft tissue continuity is very important in such cases. If we have to have a, uh, uh, I mean, a gratifying uh, surgery, surgical result. And sometimes, in total calcinectomy, total uh, soft tissue additional procedures for soft tissue coverage may be required. And there is a uh, uh, explanation in literature, there's a mention in literature that around 14 percent patient, even after total calcinectomy, may go on to baloney amputation because total cal calcinectomy may too not be able to prevent, I mean, totally eradicate the infection. So this, we need to tell the patient that he may after all require uh, amputation, but, and at times he requires heel containment braces in post-op uh, period. Complications, the early complication is of course wound dehiscence and very late complication is telonavicular subluxation. This figure, uh, this picture I have taken from the same paper of Judith Bomhar, where there's a dislocation which was required, in which case a surgery was required fusion of telonavicular joint was done. So this is my case. So this is six weeks post-op and we can see that the infection is gone, the total, because the total calcanectomy has been done, there's no sign of any fragment of calcaneus. And this is the patient at that time, six weeks post-op. Standing and sitting, if we see the pictures properly, there's the darkening of the skin because of the long standing infection. But if we see the subsequent pictures, this is 24 month post op. It is getting better. And the most gratifying thing. Better. Better, Devon. Better, Joe. <laughs> you can see the smile on his face, actually. And this is the picture. I, I really had written a mail to Judith Bomhor and could meet her in Ifascon 2018. She told me one thing very nice, and that was that whenever she has gone abroad, people have come up to her to really say thank you for this one paper, which has given her most of much recognition for this paper. So the take-home message is, it's a good food uh, salvage alternative and functional food preservation can be done while the infection may be eradicated. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shantanam, uh, for this. Uh, um, uh, I, we have used uh, uh, these uh, calcaneactomies, uh, what you call through Ganslin approach, uh, for chronic osteomyelitis in a few case, cases and uh, the patients are reasonably satisfied after this procedure. But I would just like to ask you one thing. You said you maintain a continuity of the tendo Achilles with the plantar tissues. I, 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 I have not followed that, how it is done and how, how what trick it is to maintain that continuity because if we see the insertion of the tendo Achilles on the calcaneus, and then after that, there is a big portion which is just bony, and then the origin of the plantar fascia starts from the medial uh, tuberosity. So how uh, that, that you have something like a continuous leaf which is going from a, a tendo Achilles to uh, the plantar. I have not uh, been uh, keeping this thing oh, I mean, in my mind. I would be very happy if I, if I can improve my results. Thank you so much, sir. That's a very valid question. And I'm happy that you have pointed this out. The thing is that you would agree, sir, 
that even calcaneus has a periosteal sleeve yeah but okay and and you take care during surgery not to give any kind of transverse incision it has to be longitudinal you split so the so that's a gans 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 approach split, you split yeah, approach you split and then with a periosteal elevator very meticulously we try to excise out the calcaneus leaving a thin yeah. band of periosteum yeah that's that's i agree together, that is there together with that the heel pad which we all know is a very special kind of soft yeah, tissue yeah, yeah. no other tissue in the body can actually replace it so we have to take all the precautions to preserve that heel pad as well okay so if we give a longitudinal incision only and try to preserve the periosteal cover you will be able to probably save it sir we i have done just two such cases of because these cases are not so very common what you want to say is that do everything do supper costly and enucleate the uh, calcaneus uh, uh, out of everything so that, uh, uh, that is okay so there is nothing special you are doing for stitching or something like that to no, the, no 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 uh, okay that that is uh, quite understood that you don't want to uh, you go to i i in fact even don't use periosteal elevator i use knife it is just like yes. have a, a l shaped flap of the uh, uh, calcaneus when you are doing a lateral extensile approach and you yes. use knife for it it is better to use a knife than even to use a periosteal because yes. it's a very friable sort of uh, bone when you are uh, and it it looks like when you do these calcaneectomies it is just like uh, you are doing a sharko sort of thing and they, they are just a powdered they just come out and it become very difficult to use uh, uh, those uh, periosteum elevators so i i find knife as a better tool uh, yes, i was i was i was actually about to mention that and i happy sir you have done this already either you use a very sharp periosteal or better still as suggested by you use a knife yes yeah. uh, anyone else would like to add anything so uh, how long do you keep uh, these patients on heel cushions heel cushions santumada right right so basically in the post op period we have given the patient a back slab which was used to be which used to be removed and then cnd done as you can see at 6 weeks time the patient was able to walk and stand a little and if he had although i was wanting to use a uh, that uh, that orthosis for a longer duration of time because i was really worried that the soft tissue might dehes it might you know become friable but in this particular case it did not but if in a particular patient that happens and if that patient has pain this is always better to use those things yes <laughs> any more question from panel i think we can go with our next presentation no i i i have a question to sir dinesh please yeah, yeah. Sure. so you show that there is a chance of talonavicular dislocation in this yes. type of cases in later course but yes. do you take some precautionary measurement in your case to prevent that particular talonavicular but you in your case there was no talonavicular uh, dislocation so is there any Talo, yeah talonavicular dislocation is a is a long term complication it doesn't happen overnight it doesn't happen immediately after the surgery so i really warn the patient that if at all any kind of discomfort is there in or if any pain is there any sudden appearance of this thing is there then he should come immediately to me so that thing is there apart from that no other precaution okay. i think the talonavicular okay. dislocation could probably be more in neuropathic cases and all because i think in a regular patient who has got a preserved neurology yes, there is unlikely there, there that is the less chance. chance yeah yeah unlikely there is the less chance yeah i can uh, i think you can I, I, i also take this opportunity opportunity to say my pranam to pratyush da who is a very senior yeah. faculty <laughs> sir okay. welcome pratyush sir thank you thank you actually, actually i actually i did a mistake i entered in youtube and i have to was in youtube <laughs> so i said sir i my picture so i call to come on so there is a problem with old people you know no no no, <laughs> no sir you, you are, are not, you are you are you smart are enough on smartphones <laughs> thank you Yeah, as I said, we can go with your cases, right? Oh my, okay.
প্রত্যুষ দা নমস্কার নমস্কার স্বর্ণেন্দু ভালো আছো তো ভালো আছি ভালো গুড So while uh, Abhijit is uploading, oh, he is there. Okay. Yeah, yes. All right. Okay. Visible? Yes, Ajay. Yes. Where? You are okay. With, with, yeah, very simple case. Okay. Let's go to slideshow. It's not happening. Just give it a minute. Okay, there it is. Yes. Okay, so calcaneus fractures, there's nothing much about this. I think we have already discussed quite a few times regarding calcaneus fractures. Just, uh, but this came at a time when most of the webinars were going on. And this picture was actually doing the rounds at that time. Uh, so that <laughs> most people were finding webinars to be too much. And they were actually uh, dying. I, I don't think that can be a possibility at all. I think this must have been put by somebody who was not keen to join webinars. I think they are the ones who were circulating in this. And this was exactly at that time when I got this case also. And uh, yes, I was yes, asked, this, this photo is now viral in the group. So yeah. It is. Yeah, okay. Oh, and, everywhere, uh, everywhere, all the groups. Yes, I think so. Yes, that's what, that's what, and around the same time, I got this case. So I, it was when I was searching for the pictures. So I just found it there. I said, I'll put this in. So And I was all fully geared up for the case like this. So this is what was needed for me. And uh, so this is a very simple case of a calcaneus fracture. Unfortunately, I don't have the CT films with me today. But uh, that's what it was looking like. Hardly displaced fracture on this view. And uh, hardly displaced fracture on this view. So how many of you would plan to go in for a, a lateral extensile approach? And how many would go in for a minimal invasive in this case? And if at all you think there is anything with regard to the medial side. So is there, do you think there's a fracture on the medial side also as well? No, no, uh, Ajay, this, uh, I think if you go back to the lateral film, can you go back oh. to the lateral film? Yes, I can. Yes, yes, because because you see your uh, subtalar joint, your the jisan is completely disturbed and also your volar ones, okay. But mostly the jisan, okay. So yes. this can be, this can be even managed with nowadays we are doing with this small minimal invasive approach like your uh, sinus tarsi approach. Correct. Yeah, okay. See, can I see something? Yes, Sandro. Yes. Yeah, sir. The, the approach that we are employing also depends upon our own ability to do that case with that particular approach. While I may be able to do this with Sansa approach, many of my friends who have just started to do this surgery may find it a little difficult. So, ideally, while this case should be done with a uh, maybe with minimum invasive approach of employing something like sinus tarsi approach, somebody who is less conversant with the approach is quite justified in doing this with extensile lateral approach provided all due precautions have been taken like appearance of the wrinkle sign and proper dissection. So that is my answer. Okay. Can, I, can I add something? Yes, sir. Uh, I would never, never decide the approach only on a plain X-ray in calcaneus fracture. Okay. My standard is a CT scan, unless yes, I have a CT scan. Calcaneus fracture CT is hundred percent mandatory. You, you to me, it is in this case. It is mandatory. It is only I like to have CT in every case of calcaneus. It's the like, only place where I don't, where I feel I am doing to do only conservative treatment. If I have to do a surgery, I have to have a CT of a calcaneus, except in a vulgian sort of fractures where yes. there is a B convulsion, extra articular, and the only thing important is that you have to protect the soft tissues and try to reduce them early. This is my dictum. Uh, I don't know what others are following. I fully okay. agree with you, Dr. Rajiv that if one has to do a surgery in calcaneal fracture, a CT is mandatory and an axial view of the X-ray. Okay. Axial he did, sir. 
Actually, it is there. No, CT was done in this case. CT was done in this case. Just that I don't have the films with me here no today to show. No, so that is the only thing. So, okay. If you want to go ahead with it, please. Uh, this is my uh, how I I do. I do. Right. Okay. Right, and so this was just marked out the length and the width of the the height of the plate was just marked out in this case, just to see because uh, if you have seen most of the plates which are available, I think we don't have specific sizes available. Even with synthes, when I do get plates, there are only two sizes which are available, and Arthrex has got four sizes of plates starting from 55 mm going up to 76 mm, different sizes plates. But then particularly in this particular day, the Arthrex was unable to provide because he is Chennai based. and he didn't have plates for me so if i were to do this by an mis was what my thought was then i would need that plate the the wave plate the specific atrix plate which is available and i didn't have a choice in this case so i decided to simply go ahead there is a definitely a combination here and if you can see this is the articular surface here the rest of the articular surface is here and uh, it's a good enough x ray which will tell us exactly what all has happened in this particular patient Okay, there's a fracture. There's a line going there, line going here, and there's some amount of a virus, which uh, malalignment, which has taken place of the tuberosity, and uh, the substanticulum, though there is a fracture here, has not displaced. So this is what was evident from this, and uh, the CT was done and was showing the very similar things. It didn't show anything different in this case. Okay. So, so that's the approach I decided to go in with. So because of all these reasons. because con considering that the plate was not available one and secondly uh, i thought that i had waited enough for the wrinkle sign to appear i demonstrated yes. it quite adequately in this case that the wrinkle sign is there so that's the approach which we take so we spare the surul nerve there and uh, that's just in front of that's a tendon crease there just in front of the tendon crease junction of the dorsal with the plantar this is the fifth metatarsal that's the lateral malleolus which is marked out so the a uh, video i don't have of this particular case but i don't think we need to go in for the video in this case should i go ahead with this video oh, okay. yes. yes okay so this is uh, which i generally do so this is start off in the same patient is in the lateral position so just in front of the uh, tendon achilles there is the vertical limb and just at the dorsum in uh, junction of the dorsum with the plantar surface of the skin is the Uh, horizontal limb the two of them are joined there together and then that end can either be curved or it can be straight depending on what you choose once we have done that the dissection is going to go directly down into the bone we are not going to go uh, create a plane there and once that dissection is done then we are going to have the three wires to help us one wire goes into the lateral malleolus to hold it and uh, perform the retraction there so that is what is done with the lateral malleolus one wire goes into the talar neck and one wire is going to go into the calcaneo cuboid joint into the uh, cuboid so that we have a anterior so once we have done this we have the entire calcaneus visible to us we have the entire calcaneus visible to us in this so once that is done we have the lateral wall which is visible we can take this out and remove the lateral wall and go ahead with whatever reduction and the maneuvers that we need to do so once that is removed you can see that the so the so that's the maneuver which is needed where you need to lift it up and reduce it to the talar head uh, to the posterior facet of the talus there so that is shown and then we can go ahead with the fixation So something similar here also. Then we can just see that uh, this is lifted up, and uh, that's how we are going to get the reduction in place. Okay. I have to just give me a minute now because my laptop battery is going to. So that's the reduction manual which is needed, wherein you lift up all the fragments which are there, and bring them back in position. So once that is done, so in this particular case, coming back to the same patient, so the same retraction was done in this case. You can see the fragments which are visible there. Lateral wall is here, separate fragment, posterior facet which is driven down and uh, it was lifted up and put back in in position. And then at the end of the fixation, 
we're able to get an adequate stable fixation in this case. So that's the range of movement. You can see the dorsal and uh, plantar flexion going on completely, the inversion and diversion going completely with that stable. And uh, there's a picture which shows the articular surface there. You can see that there's a very well reduced articular surface. That's the, uh, when I tried to go it, uh, push it into inversion, I could see the uh, very good uh, posterior facet of the talus there. So this is what the heel was looking like. So once the fixation was done, you can see that the heel width has been restored. There is no widening of the heel. And of course, I use a drain in all these cases to drain out the hematoma. And I use staples in most cases now. So ever since more than two years now, I've been using only staples. So paraoperative x-rays, a couple of them I thought I'll just show you. One is this the Broden's view, which we can take. So this will tell us whether we have got a good reduction of the posterior facet. The septilar joint is well reduced or not. So once we get this reduction, we can be rest assured that we have restored the uh, facet to a uh, very good condition. Okay. So this wire which is here is there just to hold the tuberosity, the virus which was there, which was corrected and held there for some time. So that's the virus which was corrected and held in position for some time. So that's the, how the fixation would be at the end of the procedure itself. And at the end of a week, we can see that the surgical site was looking good. End of six weeks, you can see that the patient has got a uh, completely healed scar. It's just six weeks now, so completely healed scar. There are absolutely no signs of a heel widening, nothing at all. So we have just not at allowed weight bearing for her. But then that's the range of movement that you can get in that case, even at end of six weeks. I don't use a plaster in any of the patients. So that's the range. Complete hind foot range of movement is there. And then this, this side, you can see that the complete dorsi and the plantar flexion is already there. A complete dorsi and a plantar flexion is there of the ankle range. So that's about it. A very simple case. So let's go in for a discussion now. I think anything that we would like to, each one would have done differently. Yes, uh, it has been done very nicely, Ajoy, and I really mm -hmm. congratulate. Okay. My question is, as you have rightly said in your presentation, that it is the surgeon's cho choice to either to make the axilla of the incision either curved or pointed. Right. In your case, I have seen that you have made it absolutely pointed. Yes. And I always curve it. Okay. So I wanted to have your view. Is there any particular reason that you prefer to have it really pointed? No, just that when the two meet, it becomes like that. So I leave it at that. I start one from this end, I start the other from that end. When they reach there together, you can either curve it or we can straight make a straight yeah, incision. Yeah, yeah. So we can because, just leave because, it as a straight incision. Because the chances, the incidence of wound dehiscence and tissue necrosis is maximum at the axilla. So I also do the way you do. I start from one length and I start from another and try to join. So when I am, let's say, 0.5 centimeters short on each side, I try to curve them. Just to, I'm not criticizing it at all. Uh, this I don't is curved. Know. This, this is curved. This one is curved. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this this is curved. Yeah. I, I do use the curve. Yeah. One. yeah. yeah. On, the, it's on on that day. Whatever uh, comes to mind, it is what I go. Uh, no. uh, but I, I never Excellent. make it at right yes. angle. I yeah. never Unless, make it at right angle. I always make it curved. Yes, me too, me too, me too. Sir. I always make it curve. The other, the other, the other point probably that should yes. be pointed out here yes. is that while doing this surgery, you would also always ensure that mm -hmm. at all times during surgery, you should be able to see the lateral view as well as the axial view, isn't it? Yes. So, so yes. that you can, in the axial view, you have to see the constant fragment. Whether the first screw that you are putting in, it going Correct. into the constant fragment or not. Correct. So probably to uh, to position your CM is very important, isn't it? Yes. So yeah, yeah. yeah, that picture I don't think I have in this presentation. There on another one. So the axial view, yeah, the two ways of doing the axial. I think one of the simplest ways of doing it is because the patient is already lateral. So you just have yeah. to tilt, have to tilt it up a little, mm -hmm. and uh, ah. you take it the reverse way in. So from below upwards, you get a very good kind of a projection. That is one way. The other way of doing it is if you want to image it in the lateral itself, you have to take this CM horizontal. 
Yes, yes. With the source mm -hmm. coming as close to the heel as possible, then again you can see it very well. So there are two ways of doing it. One is that, and one is this. In all calcaneal fractures in operations, this soft tissue problem always remains a matter of concern. Yes, it is. How do you manage that? So it's uh, so I don't know because once we go with the flap which is directly going onto the bone. The chances of uh, soft tissue causing a, a real problem is much lesser. It depends always on the tissue handling. So I think once yes, I agree. Have... I would you agree with Ajay yeah. that if we wait for the ankle sign and wrinkle sign to appear, and our dissection is directly right up to the bone with only sub periosteal dissection with sharp knife, so that even the uh, the perineal tendons are part of the flap. And then we take use the three K wires to avert it, and there is good handling of the soft tissue. Probably the problem of soft tissue dehiscence will not occur. I think the problem of the dehiscence of the soft tissue is due to the lateral calcaneal artery, and it has been proven in patients where the patency of the lateral calcaneal artery is not there, they are likely to have a more uh, necrosis of the flap. And there's a uh, one study in the Foot and Ankle International. I don't know. Uh, I did say in the last meet or not. It is uh, around about uh, more than hundred cases. What they did was they they did a, a pre-operative Doppler study to pick up the lateral calcaneal artery, and they could find that in around about ninety-five cases, around about one or two here or there the lateral calcaneal artery was patent and in six cases it was not patent and when the surgery was done the lateral extensile approach out of the 95 patients only one developed a, a flap necrosis of the wound complication but out of the six cases who did not have a, the patency of lateral calcaneal artery five developed wound complications so I don't know, is it always the handling, which is, of course, you have to handle your flap very, you don't have to use your sharp forceps, uh, you don't have to retract them. Then uh, when you're stitching, you have to have your knots not on the flap and your stitching should start from the, you know, the end and then slowly move towards the center. So these precautions, I'm sure everyone must be taking when, uh, uh, and uh, then the K wires to retract the flaps. But still, there is there is another paper, sir. Yeah. There there is another paper where they uh, told that if you, uh, in, in spite of uh, giving the K wire, if you handling it with uh, your assistant, the chance of necrosis is less, because they told otherwise that you fix this three K wire for a such a long one hour or one and a half hour. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. there is a stretching. So if someone handling it with manually, they sometimes when you not doing something they will relax, relax in yes. intermittently yes. relax there is another paper maybe maybe mm -hmm. it, it sounds logical to me i haven't gone through that paper it sounds logical to me provided your uh, 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 your assistant understand what flap uh, yes. Yes. that is yes. very important that yes. is because otherwise if they just sometimes keep, if they so it's, over it retract is, also it will be over heelless attraction to assist the surgeon you know, when you are an assistant, you want to give a very good view to the surgeon, surgeon yes. to please the surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if you are his thesis guide. <laughs> yeah. 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 Any reason for using a staple only for closer? I have been using it. It saves time and I found it to be equally good. Which I don't feel like going in for the algo donut stitch anymore. Yeah. I very meticulously, three, four years ago, I used to close with the algo donut. Then a couple of times, because of shortage of time, when I was doing a bilateral with the spine. So that time uh, I just used staples. So that time I didn't have any problems. Then I started using staples with it. I Let me tell you, my friend Joy. Let me tell you, you're not alone. Even I do that. Okay. <laughs> I will not accept it, but I do that. <laughs> yeah, but, but Raji, uh, most of the time when I do take this extensile approach for the calcaneum, I all, always till date I do use this meticulous uh, the subcutaneous and also yeah, donut. Donut. Donut donut donut. Donut. Because if you do the donut, donut is excellent. Yeah. So uh, you could I, directly I, I step over skin. Yeah. 
accept staples i have tried all the sutures do not be <laughs> in uh, far near near far and then the simple uh, matter sutures uh, and personally speaking i have found uh, uh, no difference uh, between them unless you handle the flap properly yes, yes, that, and the, and that is the, yes, the you have exactly. the knots at the right side you start uh, you don't handle them properly i think everything works with you but i have no experience with the uh, staples i don't have i i i i have also never used the staples i i, am I think maybe you should start using it says a lot yeah, of time yeah why not <laughs> yes. it can be done because 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 then only you have to keep keep you with your monocryl and all these subcutaneous stitches and then you go ahead with the staples probably that will be good right so the talus case i'll just share Yeah, 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 yeah. Please. Okay. I really like this bofak. It looks like bofas. Yeah, it's very similar. The idea came only after that. <laughs> Because after they hosted the bofas, so I I found that design to be very useful. So I thought. It's Bangalore, also pretty foot and ankle fit. Uh, yeah. So, so It's I thought very maybe impressive. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I can is... use AOFAC. Huh? Yeah, I'm just a raw to building foot. It should be okay. So it should, case. Case. it should be an it shouldn't be an Udaipur foot and ankle clinic. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. So not is the... not orthopedic foot and ankle clinic. Uh -huh. so, not go fact. Okay. <laughs> okay. So now this is this simple case which had come three years maybe it was two no days later. Huh? This is no way simple case. This is no way simple case. No way simple. Okay. So so this was uh, actually this X-ray was first sent to a friend of mine. So and uh, this was also associated. Uh, of course, this was there. This was the X-ray taken at our place. and this also was associated so this was a 23 year old male who was staying about 200 kilometers away from bangalore so it a place called chitradurga davangere so that's where he hails from had this injury and uh, he was just about weighing about 110 kilos so the surgeon there felt maybe he's better handled off in bangalore rather than there so he shifted him here so these were the injuries that he had come with and uh, of course it was 3 days by the time we saw him and uh, these were the ct scans that we did for him so ct scans so this was the simplest way of viewing the ct scan so you can see it there you can just tell me when you want me to stop i can stop it for you okay so that's the axial view this is the coronal view okay so when we are there you can see that so where you expect the talus to be there it is not there so the whole space is empty okay so this is where the talus should have been but it's there there at the back the coronal view and then we go on to the sagittal in the sagittal is a lot more more definitive you could just see it you could see that the whole space is empty and the talus the entire uh, body and all is lying there at the back 3d reconstruction of the same so you can see that's the amount of comminution which is there so there's a dislocation which has happened both the talonaclus intact but the rest of it so this is kind of comes as a type 3 hawkins so there's a posterior dislocation of the uh, talus and in addition there is a fracture of the middle malleolus so something similar uh, this again video doesn't belong to this particular patient but then this is what i some always do so that's the combination that we see and uh, there's two approaches that we use one is the anteromedial approach and one is the anterolateral approach so anteromedial approach if you can see is, is running is generally running there from the medial malleolus going up to the navicular and the anterolateral approach is in line with the fourth toe so that's the incision that we take so on the medial side we can go in quite boldly because there's no structure which is there underneath and you can go down and you can directly see the bone there on the lateral side on the other hand we'll have to go in a lot more carefully 
because there's a superficial peroneal nerve which is there. So we just do a dissection and then we're going to uh, see it over there. So isolate the superficial peroneal nerve and keep it out of harm's way. And then we can go down and dissect to see the bony fragments there. So once we have the bony fragments in view, all it needs is going to be some amount of a reduction and fixation by means of two screws. So as simple as that. Okay. So some in cases like this, wherever there's when there is an addition, a medial malleolar fracture also. I think it's ideal to increase the side of the medial incision to go above the medial malleolus. And once we have done that, we can go down and see that the posterior, the tibias posterior is there, and you can see the fragment. The medial malleolar fragment is there. You can get it out and keep it separately, and then identify the talar uh, fracture which is there. The, well, the rest of the body of the talus is generally situated over here. And this you're going to bring it back. You're going to give attraction along this side, pull this down and put it back in place. So which is what is done. And at the same time, we need this lateral approach because uh, the bone being such that you cannot visualize it completely only from the medial side, you also need a lateral approach and then you're going to see it from there. So the reduction and all on the both the medial and the lateral side has to be adjusted. Only then we can go ahead with the fixation. So the fixation means that we can use for this is by means of screws. So we can use 4.5 cc screws. And uh, on one side, that's the lateral side, we can generally go in with a compression mode. So the screw is going from the anterior to the posterior direction, which is found to be the best way of fixing these kind of fractures. And on the medial side, we can just go in with a screw with a head which sinks in very well. So this is not going to anywhere be in the line of the navicular at all. And this also is not anywhere in the line of the navicular. It is going to be from the outer side and then it is going to go in. So this one is on a compression mode. This one is a positional mode. So a compression mode can be achieved by using a partially threaded screw. You can use a washer onto it. And this one, if you don't use a washer and you just about tighten it. You don't over compress it, then you will not get a compression on the medial side. So that's how you can go ahead with the fixation. This particular case, so this was how he was fixed. There's one other thing that we can do is operatively we can take a canal and Kelly view. So in the canal and Kelly view, we are going to tilt the, uh, the foot itself into about 15 degrees of internal rotation and the tube is tilted about 75 degrees. So once we do this, we can see the medial aspect of the neck very clearly. And in that, we can also assess if the reduction and all is good or not. So in this case, we can do that. So we can check that the reduction is uh, well, red, uh, whether the, this thing is reduced well or not. Okay. So that's the view which we can take, the canal and Kelly views. Also, up till this, one of the reasons I put this case up is because I also need your opinion on how to further manage this patient. Now, this is what, at the end of three months, uh, three a little more than three months, the patient's x-ray was sent to us again. So saying that he is like this now, should we allow weight bearing? Now, because he also had a forearm fracture, all along he was kept non-weight bearing only. So at this stage, so I decided to tell them that, no, no, there's no way we can start weight bearing for this particular patient. Hold on for some more time. Of course, all of us can appreciate the changes of AVN, which are already there in this fragment. And uh, it would definitely be expected in this case also, because it was three days from the time that we actually, from the injury that we had got to see this patient. That's the forearm which fractured, which healed up and uh, did not cause any problems. So once this was achieved, this was somewhere in the month of March, I think that this, the forearm united very well. So only then we allowed him to walk a little. And uh, at that time we allowed him to walk with some kind of an orthosis. So this is the most recent x-ray I have of his. This was taken sometime in the month of June. And uh, this is how he is looking. I'd like to know your opinion now, whether we should be going in and doing something for this avian or should we wait? What would be the opinion of I think, the panel? I think, I, I think we should wait. Okay. Yes. No, wait, wait. You have to wait because it is only six months now, Ajay. Yeah. Yes. So you have to, wait. to know, yes. Yeah, you have to wait for some time because you can wait for I think one and a half year till one and a half. Eighteen year. months, yeah. Eighteen months, I think is it. At least. Uh, can I can I suggest something? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I think it will not be wrong here to get a CT scan done. Okay. 
CT scan will let you know whether union is taking place or not. Okay. If union is taking place and there is AVN, then is, there is always chance that reperfusion will occur and AVN will disappear by and by in due course of time. Okay. But if union hasn't occurred, then the chances of AVN further worsening is very high. And this is the right time to intervene. Okay. So my idea would be, although I also had a question as to, uh, there may be some reason why you could use only screws and why didn't you use a plate on the latter side, but that is beside the question now. I would okay. suggest that you get a CT scan done, if not an MRI also, and see whether union is taking place or not. If it is taking place, then you wait. And if it is not, then you remove the screws, go to by going in again, putting some, some graph and do a repeat fixation with plate, compressing from the lateral side and putting a positional screw on the medial side. That is probably would be my approach. Okay. Yeah. I, would, I would rather agree with it because I'm not very sure about the quality of union at this stage. This okay. x-ray uh, yes. does not show very, very uh, clearly that the fracture has united. So the question always remains that the fracture is probably still ununited. And then okay. if it's uh, after 18 months of the surgery, if the fracture is still ununited. No, no it's it not must, 18 months, sir. It is just it six must months now. Something to augment the union status. No, no, it okay. is six months only. Yes. No, no, I agree. It is only six months at the moment. Yeah. We have to wait. And that is why it is absolutely the right time to intervene. We should not uh, go on waiting inordinately. It is always probably the right time to see, get a CT scan done and see if there is still gap at the site. It is. It will be a good idea. Put some graph from iliac crest and if required, a good bony chunk of an uh, uh, iliac crest as a cancellous graft and do a repeat fixation. That is probably is my take on this. Okay. I Ajay, think there, there are two issues in this. One yes. is, you said the, uh, the non-union. So we are looking at two issues. One is the issue of the union and the other, the issue of the avascular necrosis. Right? right. So... Before moving to the AVN, we need to be sure whether union has happened or not. And CT is the answer if we get the union. Now, let's say if we have the union and we see an AVN, uh, uh, now uh, what will be the panel doing? They will be putting the, let's say the one alternative is it doesn't have a new, non, uh, it doesn't have a union. The other possibility is on CT, there is a union. What will house like to do? Uh, ask the uh, patient bear weight or not. Yes, yes. If the, yes, CT if the union is there, if the union is there, yeah. there is a still a AVN, then yeah. it has to be a guarded weight bearing because sometimes there is creeping substitution of the vessels and it is not uncommon to see that uh, that uh, Taylor head, Taylor dome getting revascularized. So if union is there, and there is still uh, AVN that the, the prospect is not so bad and we can still uh, go ahead with guarded weight bearing without doing any kind of intervention, without any kind of active intervention. So that is what I wanted that in this paper only what uh, uh, Ajoy had shows there is a difference of opinion. Whether, yes. you, whether you put weight or not. Not. So not then, that's what <laughs> yeah. So uh, what what I I uh, agree with uh, Shantanu that uh, we, I would like to do a guarded weight bearing in this case and follow this patient up. I won't wait for the signs of AVN to appear. If with guarded weight bearing and slowly and gradually increasing the weight, I don't see any collapse. Then ultimately, I will allow the patient to bear weight after two to three or four months if not no collapses happen. I won't be waiting for 18 months or two years uh, for the patient non weight bearing. That is my opinion. There is no nothing data to support it. Nothing, but I just wanted the panel to say how they would follow this case, whether they would keep their uh, patient non weight bearing for two years 
क्वेश्चन इज you are trying to unite a, a live part to a potentially uh, dead or, or uh, uh, you know there's avian mm-hmm. so it, 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 you are uh, it's a really a challenge to actually unite this part to an avian part so if you can read this very clearly it says that it's important to realize the fracture talus neck can heal in the presence of an avian so that yes. that is what i want again that is what i wanted i have read it that is what yes. i want Not so even. when it has united, yeah. so general, it would probably be uniting at the same time that it would. Uh, you, and I think so, yeah. So that is what I wanted to convey. So we can go ahead with the fixation okay. even in the presence of AV. Okay. Yeah. Ajay, I, there is a question from my side just for the also to Rajiv. Yes. Do you find this sort of uh, this uh, like your Hawkins three of uh, three okay. days old? Do you put your X fix for your uh, surgery or yes or no? For the reduction and for the surgical sake, not for the long term. Okay, no, I don't put an X fix. I use a pin which I, goes I, to the calcaneus, very I, similar I, to that, because I, I have a lot of help along with me. So I allow the pieces to pull along that line. So it it almost amounts to putting an X fix without actually putting an X fix. No, if you can use the, can we use the distractor like in the TBI and in the calcaneum so that yes. your Reduction and surgical uh, wound it, it becomes easy for to because otherwise it is very difficult to relocate the posterior fragment. It becomes very hectic. Extremely difficult. Yes. Because we don't have very large series, large experience. Hardly I have managed three cases like that, but I do, I can't tell. But theoretically, I know that it is better to use the distracted for the help. What is yes. Rajiv's opinion? Yeah, definitely. Uh, this case. Uh, the one he showed, he never did a medial malleolar osteotomy. He showed it in another case where he already had a medial malleolar yes, fracture. Medial uh, so, uh, so I, if I see this uh, fragment going posteromedially, what, what, which is a normally uh, happens in a type three Hawkins, I have very low threshold for doing a medial malleolar osteotomies in these cases. So once you do the medial malleolar osteotomy, then it is easy to manipulate these fragments into position. And even if then it becomes difficult, I have no hesitation in using a distractor in these cases, and I do use distractor to get them in position. Once this posterior body part come in position, I also try to fix calcaneus to the talus with a wire. so that at least you have a subtalar joint in in position so you don't have to worry about that and then you are left only with the neck so then you can manage neck your your uh, your sub your body is in position as uh, in 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 relation to the ankle and the subtalar joint with the k wire and then you do it so this is how i proceed i prefer medial malleolar osteotomy if i can handle them with the uh, with the wires uh, uh, with the joysticks it's okay if it doesn't very low threshold i try to put the fixator and then get into place uh, put the body in relation to the calcaneus and the ankle hey, hold it with the k wire and then try to fix the neck part into it this is how i proceed ajay there is a question just for the sake my, of my learning Yes. when you find this sort of neck and this is comminuted this this way okay. is it do you do you prefer the always put the screws or if you prefer to put a plate on the lateral side because yes. lateral col- column will prevent your varus na uh, see that's what uh, i always felt that the comminuted side if you are putting a plate you if you should put, be putting it on the side of the comminution rather than against the comminution no 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 yes. suppose this comminuted suppose this fracture the comminution is generally on the medial side You put the plate on the medial side, but but, but you uh, with, the, with the screws only, two screws. Do you uh, do you feel that even with the positional screw you can maintain that, or is better to put the plate? With the positional screw, it does maintain because all these previous uh, fractures which I have treated, I have used only that one only. I used a plate only in one case where I had to fix the body also along with it. That's the only time I used a plate. 
Rajiv, how you go ahead with this this support this this fracture for your for if you are treating this one? For me, I I uh, I have a little uh, uh, um, I I'm a little worried putting your my plates medially. What I have, I prefer to use. Basically, what you want, you want to have a stable, rigid fixation, and you want to avoid collapse on the medial side. Yes. So, to adding stability, you can even if you have a plate on a plate on the lateral side where there is less comminution, and you you get it it in full length and over there pull the plate and use the positional screws on the medial side. This I, 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 I this is because, because my theory is that I always put the mini plates on the lateral side just to maintain the length so that there is no collapse on the medial side. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you. Have repeatedly told that the, if you put the plate on the medial side, there is a lot of impingement. I have never used any plate on the medial side. I don't. I, I don't prefer uh, on the medial side personally. I prefer it on the lateral side. So Ajay, Doctor Ajay, sir, hmm. when you are using this screw, uh, okay. would you like to use a fully threaded screw or partial? Because in your case, both these screws are partially I, threaded. I use partially threaded only. I use but, partially threaded only, but I don't but, compress it. Oh. I don't so, compress it. Whether if me, you, medially, you, if we can put a, a fully threaded screw, that will pre prevent collapse also, I think. Yes, it will. But uh, these cannulated ones, you don't get fully threaded cannulated. You have to use non cannulated Yes, that uh -huh. is the only so issue. Then, that, when that, then it can go off in some direction and all. Because the whole thing is like, uh, it's literally, it's quite commuted. Generally, most of the cases, it's quite commuted. Okay, so okay. that's why it is preferable to go in, but not tighten that screw. That also I, will work very well. I, I have a, uh, you know, sometimes you don't have money, your, your, your patients are poor or something. So in those cases, I have even used a, a simple 3.5 forearm locking screws. Yes, yes. They, yes. they have a head. Those are poor man's Herbert screw. Uh, so, so you can <laughs> put them in. Uh, we, we call it poor man Herbert screw. Yeah, yeah. So and I you have, have different length also. Herbert yeah. screw normally you don't get longer length. So you get up to 30 uh, only, correct. Uh, yeah. 30 is the 30 maximum. Only. That is a fantastic thing to use in, in these screws. So I, 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 and I have had no problem in using these screws. And you have, will not have compression also because there is no I differential have threading. I use them for capital or fractures. Yeah. So, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, please share it. I think it was a nice, nice case, Ajay. Nice case. Okay. Excellent. Sarnanda, please share your screen. Okay. Just one minute. Okay. You can take one or two questions. I will just uh, share by open of this point. Okay. I think Ajoy will have to leave something like 5, 5, yeah, 35. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Because, because yeah, no, we, yeah, yeah. He requested no, we, have, we have another meeting. Another again. meeting. Yeah. Okay, okay. I, will, I will finish within 5 minutes. Time. That I can no, guarantee. no, no. 5, 30, 5, 35, I am saying. So we okay. have meeting at 6. No problem. Okay. <laughs> so, so a lot of time. So we need to wrap it up in half an hour. Or you can yeah. continue. We can leave. Yeah. Just so one, case. So one case from uh, Sharanduda and one from uh, of no problem. We presenting no, last. We have any yeah. number, but we have yeah. another meeting. I think yeah. me and Joy are both there. Both are there. <laughs> Sharanduda, we can't yeah. see your screen. Just one. Mahindra one has been calling. I don't know why. <laughs> Rajiv, is it coming? Yeah, yes. it's visible. You are Absolutely. audible also. Yes. yes, yes. So we are all doing webinars, so it's 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 a not problem. Problem is the net. So sometimes <laughs> the problem is the net. So Ajay, as you have told that uh, we all deal the most common fractures like you know, the calcinium is the probably the common. Then comes the list frank and then comes the talus. If we don't see much of talus in our lifetime, probably two three in a year. I'm I'm not dedicated to foot and ankles. So or sometimes foot and ankle people come to me like some interest in that. So whenever you see this sort of calcanium fracture, CT scan is mandatory. So Ajay, this was the there. This was the injury that came to me and the, there were red blisters. Red okay. blisters sort of thing. Hemorrhage. Hemorrhage. That hemorrhage, is hemorrhage blisters. Yeah, hemorrhage. Hemorrhage. So hemorrhagic blisters. Okay. Young lady, 30, 32. And uh, so how you go ahead? Go ahead. Uh, you, how, how long we wait? Obviously wait for the wrinkle to appear. So, Sonenduda, Sonenduda, yes, it appears that this patient has come to you maybe on uh, seventh or eighth day. Oh, Am I right? 
no no this is not the red blister this is already it was red blister i will show you it was red blister then it was just put on the slab so that the wrinkle sign dressing and all this was done so that the, this this is just uh, this is the absorbing but this is not at the blister stage okay yes because so, in this picture the blisters are already resolving yes it is and resolving also, one, resolving resolving the scab, the scab slab plus scab it is coming to the scab now so suppose there is red blister and this sort of calcaneal fractures uh, so you wait up till the uh, the wrinkle sign to appear so ajay how you go ahead you take the sinus tap side approach for this one or you take the same like extensile approach show me the lateral side no that is more important we need to see the lateral side where we are going to make the incision we okay. are seeing the medial side no no this is the medial side the lateral yeah, picture i want to show us the lateral medial, side I, I will i will so I, if it is there i will go ahead but it, it was like uh, it took around 17 to 18 days nearing like 20 days to settle down all these blisters okay yeah okay. it is usually it generally takes that long generally it takes that time ah uh, yeah it is it is nearly like 3 weeks so i was really worried whether to go ahead with the uh, extensile approach or the or the sinus tarsi approach so how you go ahead ajay rajiv i would uh... i think it uh, depend on the combination if you just see the combination it is not much it was really comminuted i i don't just for the sake of time i was not getting all the pictures it was really comminuted and if you can see the sustained medial the sustentacular fragment also is there sustentacular fragment also this is there is a fracture and also this right. patellar gisar is completely been gone okay right. 3 weeks my go is lateral extensile lateral extensile ajay yeah. same antonu Yes. Okay. So I was bit worried because of this late blister and all this thing. So uh, you you might criticize me, but no. I took this uh, this uh, approach. Challenge. As big. This was the wound that when I took around, it was like twenty days. Okay. So Ajay, there is a question also that when you showed your calcaneum case, uh, okay. because this is the basic teaching that whenever we do the calcaneum, the first thing we do the. Sanch pin at the calcaneal tip. This thing just for the manipulation, just to maintain the disimpact and height. Do you right. every time give or not, or uh, how you decide? Because this is my first step always whenever I do the calcaneum. Uh, yes, so you can either do this because this is what is going to get the varus correction out. The tuberosity you are going to align correctly with if you put this one in. You can now either you, use a sanch pin. I use a, I use a three mm K wire in this case. Yeah, yeah. so this is this is the sanch pin on the back side mm -hmm. and once i have dissected i have take it uh, reduce the fragment and as you told that this this uh, synthesis plate size which is coming it is not at the size it is if you take the mini approach then it is very difficult to put this uh, plate and all this so so i i have just already if you can see i have already cut cut, this cut from here and also i have cut from here just to put the plate on that side okay, okay. so this is the way the, it is not like the classic sinus tarsi because this is i am just extended because it's like more or less like 3 weeks okay so i reduced it the seed is naked now we can the the subtalar fragment this is coming here and i fixed from the front and also this is the sanch pin also i put one k wire from the bottom here and this is the pin which i am retracting the soft tissue there okay okay so this is the cm picture this is the this is the pin which is retracting the soft tissue and this is the sanch pin and this is the your punch by which i am just elevating can, hmm. uh, elevating the fragment disimpacting the fragment and now you see from this picture this your gisan and this fragment is coming can you see that ajay yes we can so from the from the front I, from the, this is the where probably rajiv uh, was telling that you have to fix this subtalar joint from the calcaneum so that it stays there it stays there then you built on and then you put the, your gisan like this way so this is the way it was stitched this is the wound it, it was there and this was the x ray because i have cut the cut the uh, your plate because otherwise for, with this mini approach i cannot put the plate on the lateral side understood mm. so just i will one second i will go one second just give me one second can you see the video rajiv No, we are no. not. Okay, just one second. Open it, then share it. Yeah. Okay, okay, just one second. Is it coming? Yeah, now yes. it is. Now you yes, see, it, 
end of end of nearly four months you see the wound is already been well healed and also he is he is walking normally now it is already been like months plus and this is healed and dorsiflexion and plantar flexion is okay and she has got no pain like inverse and reversion so this is the way it was done any okay. comment from the my colleagues it is just an extended sinus tarsi and it has yes. been mentioned in the literature as an extended sinus tarsi approach because 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 you see when i put like 3 cm 4 cm i was not able yeah, to yeah, see yeah 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 i was i, I was have used this I, extended sinus tarsi I, approach because i was worried because i was very worried to take the extended yeah, yeah. like l approach you can this is a good decision taken and i certainly agree with you what i wanted you. to present only because this because these are the very basic steps how you go ahead with your sinus tarsi approach and sometimes you have to cut the plate according to your choice so that you just can neutralize the sustentacular fragment and the constant fragment so that you can put screws through that plate so that it holds good otherwise if, the, if you go put on this just this screws it is not going to succeed agreed rajiv ajay uh, yes. agreed i agreed yes. 100% agreed santanu <laughs> yeah 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 that that nicely done and since we are talking on calcaneus there is a question that i want to put for the benefit of uh, the audience yes so there are two things one is to maintain bring about the congruity of the subtalar joint right that is one step one step one no no no, no i'm just uh, enumerating that two things two things one thing is this the second is to correct the length height and width of the calcaneus yes i am repeating my question again there are two issues issue number 1 is to bring about the congruity of the cellular joint issue number 1 second issue is to restore the height length and width of the calcaneus so now my question is in the view of the steam faculty which one is more important which one should get precedence whether to restore the height length width of the calcaneus or to restore the subtalar congruity both are similarly important both in my view because i have always maintained that the issue of maintaining the height length and width is more important maybe a fraction more important than to bring about the congruity of the subtalar joint so i just want to ask all the steam faculty whether my view is right or not both are important Sadhguru, just the answer to this question is more important. Answer to this question, I see all my calcaneus fractures like your tibial sagittal fractures. If you have to, if you go, if you think your calcaneus fracture like your sagittal fractures, you have you have to reduce the fragment subtalar joint hundred percent, whatever whatever is possible, most but most most likely try to replicate and also reduce the or try to achieve your height, length, and width. Otherwise, if your volar is not corrected. then your problem is there if paras it will be problem if your calcaneal pin is not again it will be problem so, so that, this question thank you sir now now this question is to dr rajiv vora and ajoy because my 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 logic is the pain generators the pain generators are more because of the uh, disparity in the height length and width of the calcaneus rather than the congruity of the subtalar joint so my question is a very fine question that both the issues are important but which one is fractionally more important so see with regard to the this one pain generators that you are speaking of if there is a uh, widened heel so then the, 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 the this thing on to the peroneus and all is definitely yes. going to be higher lateral exostosis yes all that's going to definitely be painful or uh, compression on the medial side <laughs> then that's definitely going to be more painful no but you are hearing me yes 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 yeah okay but then on the other hand if you have a, a mal reduced articular surface i think the pain from the subtalar uh, arthrosis itself also is going to be high yes yes right. so santanu I... just 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 i completely agree with other and i will just refer to the all my juniors that there is also a sanders classification on the malunited cantilever fractures so if we go at the stage 1 is the your subtalar arthrosis sec, uh, uh, sorry lateral exostosis second is the subtalar arthrosis and third is your the three both the components are there and also the other the broadening and all these issues are there so first point is the lateral exostosis so if you don't correct the broadening then the patient will be always nagging you for this purpose Second, right, the, right, right right now the right now the malignant calcaneus fracture there was a rajiv sir's classification 
very recent the adeno classification yeah. adeno classification adeno classification so, yes, so so coming back to my question i am happy because that was my take also that the restoration of height length and width is fractionally more important than bringing about the congruity of the subtalar joint both are important but this one is more important but i think once you restore height length and everything i uh, if you have a badly comminuted fracture only then you cannot reduce the subarticular if you can get these things out the aut the subtalar will automatically <laughs> reduce it will automatic position come its position it will be in position so you don't have to do anything you so all of us all of us saying that we are differing from shantanu are actually agreeing with him Sub tailored in position, you have to um, bring out out length and height. So yes, they are basically Raji, interrelated. Rajiv, I think I think Santoni is stress, stressing upon the fractional importance of this thing, but these are fract. These very very marginal thing. Yeah. I completely agree with Rajiv. If you can achieve all three parameters of the your calcaneum, the sub tailored joint has to fall back. <laughs> it has to fall back unless it is very badly comminuted. Yes. The only thing is that Sanandu, the how often because three big sole. Uh, elevating the fragment is quite difficult because yes. you are not taking the lateral wall out in the sinus tracheal approach. You can't take the lateral wall out. Completely agree with that. Three weeks is the ultimate period. Till three weeks, you can elevate it. But if it is more than three weeks, like twenty-four, twenty-five days, nearing like four weeks, then you have to take. If the classic description is that more than three weeks, calcaneal fracture has to be treated like a malunited calcaneal fracture. You have to go with the extensile lateral approach. Exactly. Otherwise, you cannot do it. I think three to four weeks is a gray zone where it is dependent yeah. upon the surgeon uh, and and the personality of the fracture, the experience of the surgeon and the personality of the fracture, where he has to choose whether he, he can go through. But definitely, after one month, it becomes very difficult for. I think uh, we can go with Avjit last case. Avjit, you can share. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Big, no, never take the smaller approach. Always take the extensile approach. Otherwise, you cannot do it. Simply. Correct, Rajiv. Yes. Yeah. There are a few questions on YouTube regarding guarded weight bearing. Uh, this so, is this is this is for our president also, Chinmoy De Sir. Uh, Rajiv Rajiv Ramon has make me a foot and ankle surgeon recently in this Corona period. <laughs> well, you you are already a member of the professor he is always inviting me for the foot and ankle meetings okay. or our senior member sir so the sort of have another foot and ankle senior foot and ankle surgeon with us uh can you so my you can change? see you are audible also yes yes sir go ahead go ahead abhi okay so here is a simple uh, case 33 years old male fall from motorcycle right ankle injury Unable to walk, pain with swelling. Uh, did a full length X-ray from knee joint to ankle, AP and lateral. So this was the X-ray. So Rajiv Bora sir. Yes sir. Mm. Of course, the uh, protection external patient injury. Yeah, yeah, protection, and external and protection. Protection yeah. injury. You have a Weber C type of fracture. I can't see yes. medial yes. malleolus here, and yes. I need to be sure because if you look into the talus, it is overlapping the posterior part of the tibia. To see if there's any posterior malleolus or not, I would like to just get it reduced in the emergency and then go for a CT scan and then do uh, uh, the further planning. Uh, the other option is if you want me to. uh to do only on this x ray then i can tell but if you ask me that is what i am going to do put back in position as per as possible then get a ct scan and then make my plan but is and it open, consider, open or closed con considering yeah it is closed soft, it is closed so okay. soft tissues are okay closed. everything is okay whatever oh. you do this is an acute emergency you have to reduce the talus yeah right. this is an acute emergency doing a, a, do everything after reduction only yeah 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 so in opd initial management done by manipulation the ankle joint and reduce the ankle joint and put a back slab and here uh, waited for few days for the soft tissue to resolve here the thing is that 
in syndesmotic injury, this kind of things, we have to go for particular three, four things. One is total wear space here, which is increased. And after reduction, this is the X-ray which I get after reduction. So there is four things which have to uh, look uh, in the syndesmotic injury like this, whether uh, pronation, external rotation, whether plus, uh, plus uh, C type of fracture, this location. So tibio fibular wall overlap, medial clear space, as well as terocular angle. So everything is pointed out after reduction. So after getting the provisional reduction, I have no CT scan with me right now, but we go for the fibular initial provisional uh, plate fixation. This case, I go for the deltoid ligament uh, suture with anchor suture and uh, put syndesmotic screw one through uh, this is the picture power operative. You can uh, see that uh, after initial holding of the fibula, uh, we repair the deltoid and uh, we go through the one syndesmotic screw through plate and another just parallel to the ankle joint, just below the plate. So after the fixation, the initial uh, X-ray, we got the um, reduction that is corrected. You can see properly the syndesmotic picture, syndesmotic uh, injury was reduced properly. And uh, we accept this. And this is the six-month follow-up of the patient. And it is healed. And patient is working, though I not removed the screw still now. So this is my case. Yes, that was a nice case, Dr. Obhijit. Any comment from our senior faculty, like Dr. Rajiv and Dr. Yes, yes. Rajiv Bora sir or Ajay sir, anything? They are the dedicated foot and ankle surgeon. It's, it's beautifully done. Uh, I think the, the issues in these uh, cases are number one, to get the fibula in the right length and rotation. Yeah. Get the syndesmosis stable. For that stability, you use uh, only syndesmotic fixation or uh, 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 medial fixation uh, or medial repair and syndesmotic fixation depends uh, on the intraop instability. Yes, exactly. Uh, what I normally do is I would like to stabilize the syndesmosis and then see if, the, if uh, the, there is still a valgus opening or uh, uh, the stress opening. Uh, and then I would like to go ahead and repair with the deltoid. This, 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 this big, uh, actually big space, uh, uh, clear space. I am always prepared for the deltoid. But I'm surprised that uh, whatever cases I have seen, my avulsion has been at the tibial side. But in this case, I see the deltoid is avulsed from the talar side because the anchor has gone into talus. Yes. Yes. I, I I have not uh, experienced this in a very few deltoid repairs, which I have done. Uh, I, I Most of the time, I had uh, uh, the, the avulsion or, or the mid-substance here. Uh, this is a little rare type of uh, uh, injury, which I see in this. But anyway, it is beautifully done. But I have one reservation on the lateral view. If, if we go back, if it is an exact lateral view, the, the fibula is slightly anterior. If you look at the posterior corner of the tibia in the right lower picture, mm -hmm. your fibula is slightly more anterior. It should be almost little, but uh, the best thing would be to compare it with the opposite side. If the opposite side fibula on the dead lateral view is also here, then, then a fantastic job done. Okay. Okay, well, well done, Dr. Obhijit. It's well done. Yes, I think so. And I think I think Dr. Rajiv has given you one gem that whenever you fix the this sort of fracture, always taste taste after the fixes of the whether there is medial opening, yes or yes, no. Yes, yes, yes. If there is medial opening, you have to go with the medial thing. Yeah, otherwise, you, have to go. you cannot leave it in this matter. Otherwise, it is not going to because most of the time people don't test the valgus test and they just we just forget about the deltoid. That is not yeah. true. 
If operatively we can do it easily by gravity stress view and the lateral yeah. gravity stress view and like if there is a medial opening yes you can again after the repair of syndesmotic you can think yeah. of but uh, uh, my concern is most of this close injury it's only superficial deltoid injury deep deltoid injury I have rarely seen uh, the uh, abelian and it's more uh, from the uh, tibial side rather than on the teller side so this was yes. very rare injury rare yes injury. yes rare injury. And also, I want to uh, uh, trace that uh, in this kind of uh, syndesmotic injury, we should always use two screws and at least three cortes. That is very important. Yeah, Pratyushar, Pratyushar is there, sir. For your comment on such type of syndesmotic injury? I also see at the superior lateral corner of the right lower figure, the fibula is probably a, a little... Uh, uh, sure, sure. No, uh, I don't know. I, I, I can't point it out. But uh, if you look at the end, is it exact reduction of the fibula? Which may be, uh, that may be the reason that it may uh, exact congruent reduction in, in the in, in the uh, right lower lateral views uh, one. Uh, <laughs> there is a yes. step in the fibula, if I see. Yes. But if we go back to the primary pre-op pre picture, it is definitely that picture tells that there's some big combination. All the, all the yeah, yeah. yeah. It may be a piece. It may be a piece. I, I'm uh, it just say it may be a piece that you have everything in length and the small little combinated piece. So the deltoid is definitely been born in this case because there's a huge gap on the medial yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's more than one problem. centimeter. And the other yes. problem probably you might not reduce the ankle congruently after your primary reduction. Sometimes you know, the post tibial is posterior goes into that side so that you cannot reduce the talus in proper way. Yes, soft tissue impingement. And one other thing was I was just thinking in case there's more combination than this, would it be better at the end of say six weeks go in, remove the syndesmotic screw and uh, do a uh, bone grafting for that uh, fibula? Anybody has done it? Anybody wants to do it? Six weeks is too early, I think. Uh, early? Um, Okay. I, think, I think it should be minimum 12 weeks for the syndesmotic is screws to take to be taken out. Okay. And uh, so can the two be planned? I mean, supposing you hold out, in this case, the fibula is well lengthened. That's quite, uh, quite normal. Right. In case you have a fibula with, a uh, say, a gap, then uh, that would probably be, you try to maintain the length of the fibula, match it to the talus distally, but approximately wherever there's a gap, we leave the gap there, maintain the length out there, go in with the graft, and then remove the syndesmotic screw at maybe three months. We can do that. Three months is a jolly yeah. well good time. Good time. Yeah. yeah. 12 weeks is good. 12 weeks is good time. Okay. Okay. I think, yes. I think. Abhijit, yeah, please unshare the screen. Yeah. Stop sharing. Yeah. Screen. yeah. Yeah. There are a few questions in YouTube. Yes. Yes. Please put. So first we'll ask on this case, uh, any requirement for uh, open reduction of syndesmosis? We need to see in under vision, or it's not always required. Open reduction of syndesmotic, syndesmotic, syndesmotic joint. So whether you want to see it properly that you have mm. reduced or not. Because... No, actually it is on fluoroscopic view, and it is not always open to see the syndesmotic. But uh, in my case. Problem is that problem is that most of the time, if you go back to the recent studies, even the CT scan studies of this in post surgery syndesmotic reduction, it is only thirty three percent. Rest of the syndesmotic is not been reduced. So yeah. now the now people advocate that you just give a small incision at the front and check that it is completely been seated in the incisura. Otherwise, you don't know that from the radiology itself, you don't know whether it is completely been congruent, the concave and concave, con it is not in the incisura, then is a problem. It is more than 60%. So it is no harm to just put a small nick on the yeah. front and see that your in the front side is matching, then only go with the screws. Correct, Rajiv? Yeah, I think uh, I agree with the, you have to get your syndesmosis right. And if in that process, if you want to open it, there is no harm in it. It's a small uh, incision. But, yeah, but... In few cases, if you study your CT scan properly, you in the intra incisural type of posterior molecular fractures, you find actually a piece which has gone into the incisora uh, that has in this model. So, in these cases, you should always open. So, that is what I'm coming uh, out that these cases will help, you know, they, it will become very difficult to reduce 
the syndesmosis in these cases. In fact, you have to see the CT scan. And in certain CT scans, you will see there is a piece actually lying into the uh, one of the pieces, small pieces gone into it. Oh, so like in those cases, you, fragment, yeah. Yeah, you have to be very cautious. So please study your CT scan. Mm -hmm. This is one indication where, where I find that you have to uh, 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 do. Any question, Arnav? Yeah. So, a uh, few more on uh, bimalleolar fracture. So, when we should use intramedullary screw for lateral malleolus or fibula, or that should not be used? What should be the message? Uh, to me, the use of intramedullary screw is only in Weber A, that is the transverse fractures, where you can use it as a lag screw, or, or you can. So, you want a lag effect into a transverse fracture where whatever you feel you can use a tbw you can use a lag screws intramedullary screws this is the only but there is no way of imagine if you are trying to get a, a, a compression in an oblique fracture which is going uh, in intramedullary how you will get it oh, it is not possible so this is the only indication where i i would use or sometimes you have a very compound fracture, you don't have anything, there are limitations, you just want to make it as only length stable and you add X fix to that along with that, in that you can use certain intramedullary fixations. Otherwise, this is only one indication of lax screw. Yeah, I don't is, know. This is a Weber A or the supinacer adduxal injury, probably yeah. the supinacer adduxal injury if I see fracture type and when supinacer adduxal you can just give a screw. But screw is a big no for me. So, uh, Weber, uh, the Weber A is normally you get in supination adduction only. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah. Uh, once you have a rotational element, you go to Weber B. Yeah, yeah. Very difficult to push these screw in, screws in Indian fibula because uh, we have very thin canal there. Yeah. No, I have used it. I have used it. Yeah, I have used it. I have used it. 4 mm, 4.5 mm screws. I, they work. They work yeah. in supination adduction. And I have used it. Uh, Quite a number of times, but this Actually, is the only as, as rightly pointed out by Rajiv sir, if there is a transverse fracture, you'll get a very good uh, purchase in fibula. With a if fibula is smaller, you can use a four mm screw. So you, it's it's okay to use that. Right. Okay. So. So, okay. Or, uh, anything left? Yeah. One question done. Yes, because because, because Rajiv and Ajay has to leave by around. Yeah, yeah I think uh, yes. the time Stein. is there. <laughs> I think there are two questions on calcaneum or talus fractures. So okay. one is on uh, guarded wet bearing. So the people want to know what is the protocol of guarded wet bearing, and okay. any clues are available for hind foot offloading, or if you can uh, suggest something on that, and tips and tricks of reducing Hawkins type three fracture talus fracture and if uh, somebody has to nibble out a uh, part of the navicular for putting screws in right direction in the talus fracture. These are all questions we have left. Okay. Okay. So with regard to the talus itself, I don't think we would, uh, starting with the last one, we are nibbling the navicular, very rarely you don't need to do that. I think once you have done the soft tissue dissection, well, if you just have to hold this thing down, you will be able to put the screw in. And you are not going in from the articular surface. You are just going adjacent to it. So you don't need to actually nibble out the navicular. Very rarely you need to do it. And if you use the 4.5 screws, they seat in very well. So you don't have any problems with that. Okay, with regard to the reduction itself in the type 3 Hawkins, uh, like uh, it was already pointed out, very often this is with the medial malleolar fracture. Very often. the Most of the times what I have found is always with the medial malleolar fracture. So your osteotome is already done. So once that is done, so you need to push that uh, thing from behind. The whole of the talus would be broken and would be tilted out like that. So you need to push it from behind. At the same time, to create the space, you can use a stainment pin across into the calcaneus. In case you don't have a distractor. If you have a distractor, well and good, go ahead and apply it. In case you're not having a distractor, use this a stainment pin through the calcaneus and a vertical traction on that will create the space. And a posterior from that, if you just push it on in, you'll be able to get the talus in back. So once it sits in there and snaps in place, it will generally not displace, and then you can have a K wire across from the calcaneus to hold that reduction in place. Then you can do that. It's done, yeah. I just yeah. want to add, you just look into the soft tissues. Sometimes posterior tibial tendon is obstructing it, uh, it, it, it in the getting. So so just get that that thing out. You you, you should be knowing 
that the posterity will tend and can actually uh, go in there and obstruct. So uh, just remove yeah, that. Yeah, I've shown that in the listing itself. Yeah. Any more question or no on YouTube? Uh, Calcarium, one question left. Rajiv can answer. Yes, yes. The guarded weight bearing, bearing protocol for calcanium fractures. Anyone? Mostly for the comminuted calcanium fractures, you put slab. You know, don't allow the, them to wet bear for oh. according to the fracture type, like eight weeks to 12 weeks. Sometimes you have to extend up to 12 weeks. This is no that harm. That is just like any uh, uh, partial weight bearing you explain yes. to the patient, you have to do that. Not, uh, nothing special. Intraarticular uh, fracture of lower limb, it's rules of 12, I think. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Eight to 12 weeks, I think, straight. Yeah, it's not not weight bearing. No, labor before eight weeks is the, mostly it is 12 weeks. Yes, generally it is that. Mobilization is fine, but weight bearing is not. Yeah. So, so I think it's 530. Or no, we have yeah, taken all questions. We have done. We have done. We have done. So, so over, over, over to Chinmay, sir. Chinmay, sir. Sir, please. Our president of Western All Orthopedic Association, all Professor Chinmay, sir. Chinmay, well, sir, your, your mic is muted. Chinmay, sir. sir. Your mic is muted. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, First of all, I thanks to Dr. Raja and Dr. Rajiv and Dr. Santur for their nice presentation. Almost doubt clearance of any injury and disease, uh, yeah. which uh, most common faced by the general orthopedic surgeon is clear. And everything, protocol, surgical steps, approaches, everything is very nicely demonstrated. So uh, this is enough for the uh, general orthopedic surgeon. For the complicated cases, this would go to the foot uh, ankle surgeon. So, Again, thank you all and all the, the same faculties are particularly for Dindu and uh, Abhijit. And yes, few words I conclude. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to thank everyone on the behalf of IFAS for giving us an offer. Thank you, IFAS. Thank you, IFAS, for making this possible. Yeah. Partho is there, Partho? So what I was noticing is that most of the uh, people presenting WV also are IFAS members. So yeah, yeah. Is Rajiv is, uh, <laughs> Abhijit is, uh, and, uh, even the Rakesh is. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, is we, all of them. We are IFAS members since long, since long. Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm saying. So all are also IFAS members. <laughs> yeah. so it's really yeah. nice to be with, with the family of IFAS, with the family of WBOA. I really thank all of you for making me part of this wonderfully academic webinar. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Stay safe. Thank stay with. Thank, thank you. you. Stay Arnab, thank stop you so YouTube much. recording. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you, Arnab. Bye. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Santono. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you, thank Parto. You. Thank you so much. Namaskar.